budget hearings. Um, and uh, before we get started, as normal, we're going to uh, allow, hopefully, allow Commissioner Seal in. So I need a motion for that. Second. Okay, Commissioner Flowers, uh, the motion. Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, welcome again, uh, Commissioner Seal. And, um, and Commissioner Justice will, will be joining us at around 11 o'clock this morning. So, Mr. Chair, uh -huh. could I have a point of order if it's appropriate yeah, before we start our workshop? I wanted to remind everybody, and I meant to do this yesterday, but yesterday I was a little um, preoccupied with other issues in my head, that it was the third anniversary of Commissioner Maroney's passing. Yeah. And I just wanted to remind everybody of that and remember yeah. him a few minutes in your prayers and thoughts and, and his family, Eileen and Michael, if you would, because yeah. he was one of us at yeah. one point in time. Yeah, Doesn't thanks. seem like three years, but it's been three years. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I saw a couple of those things on Facebook last night and I thought, gosh, it got by me. So anyway, yeah, that's, a great, that's a great idea. Let's just take a moment of silence to remember our, our friend John. Thanks, Commissioner Long. Appreciate that. Okay, we'll jump right into it. Okay, good morning, Commissioners. Um, we have another fun, exciting day of budgets um, with seven more uh, departments coming up. So, um, again, a lot of more information to go to. Now, first up, we have is business and technology services. Sorry, Jeff, but they already gave out all the money. So, um, <laughs> you know, but you can make your pitch anyway. I'll turn it over to Linda to get us started. Good morning and happy Friday. Um, my name is Linda Larkins. I'm with the Office of Management and Budget. With me today are Jeff Roars, the Department Director for BTS, <coughs> Business Technology Services, and Jeff, Car I'm sorry, Greg Caro, sorry about that, Greg, <laughs> the Finance Manager for BTS. And I'm gonna be sharing with you the FY22 BTS budget request and Jeff and Greg will be providing some additional information as needed. Um, preemptive apology, my allergies are kicking in today, so um, hopefully that won't be too disruptive. Yeah. Uh, the BTS department provides central IT or information technology services to Pinellas County government, and that includes BCC departments and non-BCC departments like the constitutional officers, independent agencies, and the courts. Uh, the BTS department is governed by the BTS board, and that board includes representation from the BCC, each constitutional officer, and the judiciary. And before we get into the numbers, I do want to give you a quick update on COVID-19 and its impacts on the department. Uh, about 95% of the BTS department has been working remotely since the pandemic began and have been able to maintain their productivity levels. And prior to the pandemic, the department had already begun um, implementing some technology transitions that ultimately better positioned the remaining um, departments in the county to work remotely as a result of the pandemic, such as remote access licensing, deployment of laptops and mobile devices, MS Office, Microsoft Teams, et cetera. So COVID-19 really accelerated that rollout they already had in place. And because of the pandemic, the department placed a greater emphasis on what they refer to as securing the human, which is uh, focusing security on each one of us as we access via remote um, technologies, and that helps reduce the vulnerabilities. And um, for this department presentation, I will tell you that the balance of this document that you are looking at, I'm sorry, I forgot to, um, preface this whole thing by saying the, department, the document that I am using is the FY22 BTS budget analysis document. There are three other attachments in the Granicus item, and if any of us need to reference those, uh, we'll be sure to point out which document it is and where we are in the document. Um, so at, at any rate, the, uh, the balance of this is going to be on a by-program basis. There are three primary programs that the department uses, Enterprise IT Services, Custom IT Services, and Justice CCMS, which is Consolidated Case Management System. 
The Enterprise IT Services Program essentially encompasses the bulk of what the department um, services are that are provided. It, uh, it's the, the wheels on the bus, keeping everything in place and running for all of the BCC approved agency affiliates, independent agencies, and constitutional officers. Custom IT services program is essentially covers the costs associated with providing specific uh, project or program requests that a, a specific customer or customers may request. And those customers are billed separately for those work efforts. And then Justice CCMS program is just provides a central database for anything that's justice related, which therefore includes state attorney, public defender, sheriff, clerk of the court, and judiciary. And at this point, I'll orient you that I am at the top of page four. Uh, before we get into the budget numbers, the budget dollars, I want to talk with you a bit about the FTE by program. So you'll see a table there that lists uh, the FTE counts for um, several years by each of the programs that BTS uses. And you can see that in FY21 budget, there were 146, and in FY22 request is 151. So that's an increase of five. Uh, I want to point out to you what's driving those five increased FTEs. Four of them are simply a transfer that are coming over from the OTI, or Office of Technology and Innovation Department. Those four individuals have been working on the Enterprise Asset Management Project implementation. And that project is anticipated to complete the implementation in February of 2022. So those four positions are going to come back from OTI into the BTS department. And at which point after February, they will roll into a support and maintenance mode for EAM. And because OTI department and BTS department share the BTS fund, they're the only two departments that, that use the dollars in that fund. It's important to note that transferring these four positions from OTI to BTS department are, is net neutral to the BTS fund. One clarification, especially for Commissioner Flowers um, being fairly new. So we have BTS is business technology. That's all, all of your major um, systems. And then OTI, you're, they're gonna refer to it's a different department that's supporting applications with that only support board of commissioner departments. So both IT functions, but a little bit different. And so just so they can, so you can orient as they start using acronyms and stuff, you know, for the remainder of the day. So, but if you don't understand something with that, please ask any questions you have. Mr. Chair. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to note that Commissioner Peters also serves on the BTS board with us and. Uh, is fairly new and it's a very complex system that we have created here. Uh, but I would like to ask what this means down here at the bottom of page four, uh, that the four FTEs will remain in a support capacity slash until EAM goes away. So do, what does that mean, goes away? Um, it's unless and until the EAM product goes away. So it's, as I understand it, it's not, there's not an expectation that it will go away. I think the department was just really trying to emphasize that that's an ongoing need that will continue. Um, so I, thank you for saying that. Sure. I just wanted to be clear because sometimes sure. we get lost in the acronyms, but it begs me to want to know if we have no projected timeline for it going away, and I clearly heard you say, it's Linda, right? Correct. Yes, I clearly heard you say there's no expectation that it will. Why are we continuing to carry them as um, temporary employees? Or am I getting that wrong? They, they are not temporary. They are, they'll roll into a support and maintenance mode after they complete their work in the implementation mode. Um, so they're on, so they're over with OTI right now. Right, and okay. so that means they're hours supporting our stuff, right? For the implementation. And then on an ongoing basis, they're gonna be in a, in a support role um, with BTS, is that correct? Jeff? 
Uh, these four positions have been in BTS for the last four years. Um, as working through the project implementation, the dollars have been in, in OTI as part of the um, project fund. Uh, now that the project's coming to an end, the, the funds would shift into BTS's budget, as I understand it. So the, okay, the so positions have been here for the last four years, and we still have the need for those positions to ongo uh, for ongoing support. So in this particular instance, we're talking about moving money rather than people, technically? Yes. I don't mean to get so into yes. the weeds, no, but if right. I'm on the board, I feel like I, I need to yep. be able to know what I'm doing. Or That's correct. And I didn't even understand that. I didn't know where they oh, had good. those. Thank you for saying that. Makes I, me feel I, Yeah, no, I, I knew, well, I knew what they were talking about. I just didn't understand exactly structurally how they had that set up. But I think that's good information for Commissioner Flowers and Peters, because I... Oh, well, thank you for... I must have missed it or beeped out. All right, thank you. Thank you. So that explains four of the five increase in FTE. The fifth increase is um, one FTE for county ADA compliance. Um, almost one year ago during one of these budget information sessions, the Office of Human Rights uh, during their meeting discussed the, their anticipated need for a position to handle ADA compliance. And at the conclusion of that budget information session, there were subsequent meetings with BTS Technical Steering Committee and the results of those conversations were that, yes, there was a, a need to have a position perform this type of work, but that it really should reside in the BTS department, not the Office of Human Rights. And BTS department was tasked with obtaining the resource. However, they were not um, allowed or provided additional um, appropriation for that position, nor were they allowed to have a, a separate, distinct uh, FTE to cover that, so that's why the one FTE for an ADA compliance person does not live in the FY21 budget total of 146 that you see there. So instead of having that additional appropriation, the BTS department was asked to absorb the costs associated with this position within their personal services labs, which they have been doing and are doing. But for FY22, the department does not feel that they would have enough laps to cover that position on an ongoing basis. So in FY22, they are requesting to have separate appropriation for this position, hence the FTE growth in that FY22 request of 151. Okay. And um, at this point, uh, Jeff, I think you might have some additional comments you'd like to share on this topic. Uh, just, I'm going to ask one question just before you jump in there. Um, since I, we now, I mean, we knew this yesterday, the, 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 the culprit the person that's taking all these intergovernmental fees and are your, a lot of your services that are going around the county. Um, and so um, I'm just trying to make sure I understand, because you had said something a minute ago about moving one from OTI to, or four from OTI over there. And I, I was thinking that the OTI is BOCC budget and the, the BTS has their own separate Intergovernmental income. Uh, am I? I want to make sure. I, I. How are they being? How are they funded? Oops, um, sorry. How's that board funded? Sure. So um, let me direct you to uh, the table on page two. That's the BTS uh, revenue and fund balance. Um, this this particular table shows you all of the revenue that's associated with the BTS fund. And I have a note up there just uh, to make sure that for the record, it's, it's hopefully clear that this covers the revenue for the two departments that use the fund. So for instance, the charges for services, the first line there under enterprise IT services, you'll see is $3.3 .3 million um, increase in, uh, from FY21 to 22. So it's $42.5 million. That's the charges for services to cover the services that are provided by both the BTS department and the OTI department. But to your, your question, Commissioner, if, if you don't use that service, so for instance, they're doing implementation of the EAM, okay, so our Enterprise Asset Management System, 
um, over to Forward Pinellas, for instance. If they're not using the enterprise asset management, they wouldn't be charged for those services. Okay, so just because it's shifting from OTI over to BTS doesn't really change the indirect cost plan. Go ahead. Is it? All right. Oh, no, it's not crystal clear, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to slow everything down for that, so go ahead. Uh, Jeff, did you want to uh, talk about the ADA <clears throat> position? Yeah, just, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, to follow up on the digital accessibility position, um, I think Linda did a great job providing the background and the, and the moving parts there. I just wanted to mention that this position is needed really to advance uh, digital accessibility across the enterprise. Uh, so all, all of the BTS board members um, and uh, currently we are still looking to make this a uh, long-term temporary position. Uh, we anticipate at some point if we reach a level of maturity that uh, we desire, we could uh, no longer need this resource, but that's why you see it as a long-term temporary funded position. And again, it's really about advancing digital accessibility across all of the stakeholders. Um, so I think the moving pieces that Linda outlined are, are pretty accurate. Unfortunately, when we put this in motion, it was mid-budget year, so this is our first opportunity to actually um, bring anything forward from a budget perspective. Thank you. Uh, and I am uh, back to the middle of page four. Uh, the, th the last bullet point under the FTE by program I wanted to call your attention to, and that was at the time that we were uh, preparing the information that goes into um, this package for the FY22 budget, the department realized that they had mistakenly allocated four FTE to one program instead of a different program. So uh, these four FTE were allocated to the Enterprise IT Services Program. They really should be allocated to the Custom IT Services Program. And the cost associated with those four FTE is about $467,000. We are definitely going to uh, correct this moving forward. It will be corrected before we get to the proposed budget stage. But I just want to make sure that I throw this uh, fact out there because as we're looking at the budget dollars and the FTE, we'll see that the Enterprise IT Services program is for FTE and about $467,000 too heavy. And custom IT is the equivalent just on the light side. So correcting this will be a net zero impact to the department's total budget request. Okie dokie. So moving on, uh, lower portion of page four, enterprise IT services. Uh, the revenue for this program is increasing by about $3.3 .3 million. Uh, as I mentioned previously, this is charges for services. These are the cost allocations that get um, sent out to all of the BTS and OTI customers because this is a fund that collects the dollars associated with costs that both the BTS department provides and the OTI department provides. Um, and for the expenditure side, we'll see that the um, expenditures for enterprise IT is increasing by $2.6 million. There's a personal services component of this is $1.7 million. And the, there are two key factors for this growth of $1.7 million. The first one is that addition of five FTE that we talked about earlier this morning, those four from OTI for EAM and the one ADA compliance position. And the second uh, key factor is the reallocation of existing resources between the programs that BTS uses. And uh, recalling that for FTE correction, um, once, we, once we correct that in the budget software, we'll find that the Enterprise IT Services Program is really only increasing by two FTE, and that's the reallocation of existing resources between custom IT and Enterprise IT. Uh, on the remaining expenditures, uh, the non-personal services, we'll see that those are increasing by just under uh, 800, 
$90,000. And that's primarily due to some completions of uh, various initiatives and additional funding requirements for an initiative completion. The first of those is network segmentation, and you may recall this from FY21. That was a decision package that you all approved to move forward. And the, uh, they originally expected that this, that this initiative would be completed during FY21. And at this point in time, they realized that it, they won't be able to complete it, so therefore they need to carry forward the appropriation into FY22 so that they're able to complete this. And in addition to that timing shift of completion of the project, the department also realized that they needed to augment their staff to support the project. And during FY21, this current fiscal year, they've been able to use payroll laps from three vacant network positions in order to cover that staff augmentation. But they anticipate that those network positions will be filled by September of this year, and therefore there won't be that personal services lapse for them to continue with this staff augmentation. So for FY22, they're requesting additional $200,000, and this would be a one-time expenditure. Uh, another item that's driving the expenditures uh, to increase is the legacy application modernization. This, too, was an FY21 approved decision package. It was originally planned as a two-year initiative, and um, based on the timing of their ability to, to get the work done in FY21, more of it is shifting over into FY22. So while it, um, the numbers would tell us that the FY22 portion is $132,000 higher than the FY21 portion, I will point out that the overall two-year cost for this decision package is unchanged. So, the cost is not increasing for this initiative. It's merely shifting from FY, primarily shifting from FY21 to FY22. Another item that's driving the increase is the Oracle EBS or Enterprise Business Suite and OBIEE, uh, also known as BI or Business Intelligence Upgrade Initiative that was approved by this board a couple of months ago in March. And it's currently being funded through FY21 payroll apps. And the department has determined that they need uh, the services of a functional analyst in support of this upgrade. And the request in FY22 for this is just under $202,000. Um, this is a carry forward. It's not, um, it's not increasing the project budget. And it's just attributable to the project timeline. So again, it's a timing issue. And they do not feel in FY22 that they will have the ability to cover this cost via payroll lapse. Um, another uh, FY21 approved decision package that uh, we see here is the application access portal. And this was originally approved for implementation during FY21. And uh, you all may be feeling the benefits of this. This allows users to access applications using um, multi-factor authentication use, uh, with a single username and password. And uh, the FY22 budget is actually a bit lower than was originally planned when they um, presented this request in FY21. And that is a result of negotiations with the contracted vendor. And now moving on to the custom IT services program, I am at the top of page, sorry, six. We can see that the uh, revenue is decreasing by about $83,500. And as I mentioned previously, this is for specific work that uh, various customers may request. And so the reduction in revenue here is, uh, is simply due to re reductions in custom services requests. And on the expenditure side, we see that the expenditures appear to be decreasing by just under $890,000. But uh, I'll just throw out the quick reminder that um, the custom IT services budget is a little bit light by $467,000, and that's a result of that mistaken allocation of 4FTE. And this is something that we, where we have to 
reconcile this between that and the tax collector. So we still have some more work to do on that. Uh, and so moving forward, the um, the uh, the remainder of the decrease it just uh, results from better alignment of tasks and functions uh, from the BTS staff in support of the tax collector, as Barry just mentioned. The third of the three primary programs is Justice CCMS, and there typically are no revenues associated with this program. All the revenues associated with Justice are pulled into the Enterprise IT Services Program, so those were um, included in that uh, that prior point that we that we discussed the 3.3 million dollar increase in charges for services. The expenditures for this program are increasing by just under 340 thousand dollars, and this is primarily due to realigning two existing FTE within the department from Enterprise IT Services to Justice CCMS. And this is in support of initiatives that the CJIS or Criminal Justice Information System Policy Board has supported and um, provided direction to BTS uh, to continue with those initiatives. Uh, and moving on, I am at um, the lower portion of page six, uh, the potential threats. There are two items on here and these we have shared with you in the past, and they continue to be threats, as you may very well be aware, uh, cybersecurity and digital accessibility. And as such, um, the decision packages that they are requesting for FY22 in part address some of these items. Uh, question, the just yes. a quick, quick question. Um, I don't know if you'd consider it a threat, but one of the things that we've noticed over the years is just the ability, a lot of, some turnover, um, or, or I guess threat to market rates, and, and how are we doing, I don't see that as a threat here, but how, how, how is that coming along uh, in terms of stability of, of our team? <clears throat> we've actually had a, a very good year with COVID on turnover, um, it's kind of really slowed that uh, uh, turnover churn rate for BTS. I do anticipate that this, you know, the next few months and into the next year, that might loosen back up. Uh, all in all, I don't have it as a threat because we've been managing it. We do carry a lot of vacancies in BTS, uh, average around between 10 to 15 vacancies, and we're always in a constant churn of trying to hire. So um, it is kind of, uh, in a way, a nature of our industry, and uh, it's a very competitive industry. And uh, one of the things I would mention when we when we speak about this is, um, specifically in the IT sector, uh, remote work has rapidly become the norm pre-COVID, and now with COVID, it's 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 not going to go away. So we have to also look at our hiring and and re retention practices around remote work as well. So the 10 to 15 vacancies out of the 151 FTEs, so you're always, you always have, is that where the payroll lapse that you talk about? Correct, yes, sir. Okay. There's a real strategic issue with that, though. It's whether or not we bring and bring things internally or we host um, items out, and that continued migration then puts that risk out on companies that, you know, are doing worldwide systems, and so that's a real strategic issue but we've got a lot of custom applications that that's the other item, the budget item there, that you, you can't just outsource everything. Um, but there, there is a, a bigger strategic issue that we need to address in terms of how do we uh, find that right balance? Because then that addresses some of your human resources needs. If you have, especially where you have real specific skill sets, trying to hire that and keep them in a government environment is almost impossible. And so, you know, having some of those out and utilizing, you know, that paying for that expertise through private contract and having them manage that um, has to be part of our overall strategy. And they're doing a good job with that, but there's a lot more to do. Okay. Yeah, Commissioner Long. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, both of you, because I think I ask this question every year. Given we are a governmental entity and we have all these very rigid uh, procedures for procurement and or contracts that we sign, all of that sort of thing. I'm very curious about what, I don't know, what kind of brick walls do we 
work on to ensure that we aren't ripe for cybersecurity when, given, given that we're talking about public dollars being on the front burner of the latest and most evolving technologies is very, very difficult because it's very, very expensive, right? So. Yes, yeah, so and we have a we have a meeting coming up next Wednesday to talk about that very topic. Um, oh, good. That will not Can be in a, and it won't be in a public <laughs> meeting. Oh, of course. Not. Yes. Um, All the good stuff we can't hear. But um, yeah, I mean. Yeah, and also it's you're absolutely right, and you know we have kind of worked to identify each area as its own opportunity. Um, and you'll see in our very first decision package that's coming up next, that's an opportunity where we looked at staffing it ourselves versus uh, using a contracted service uh, and outsourcing that capability. And so, you know, as we transition into that first decision package, you'll see that our recommendation is not to bring in internal staff and add this capacity, it's to leverage the scale of these providers. Um, so that's an example of where we're taking pieces and it's it's on a case-by-case -case basis um, each one is a unique business case that you look at and you look for those opportunities and finally the final thing I'll kind of just mention on this is we were working on and we we actually tried this last year to have a better strategic alignment with all of our major systems and where we're going with those so when do we replace an oracle when do we replace this well we need that from a strategic issue to have a better direction we also need it from a budget issue because i i can't have jeff popping in and saying oh by the way this year i need five million dollars right we need to plan for these <coughs> we attempted to do that through gartner and failed miserably they just they didn't do a good plan for us um, and we weren't able to come together so just back trying to come at this from a different angle. Um, but we're, we're have all the appointing authorities coming together and we're looking at trying to figure out a better strategic view of where IT services are over the next you know decade. And uh, so that's an ongoing effort. Um, I just had one other question. Um, and I was reading something, not that I wasn't listening to you, Commissioner Long, but I was reading something. I, I hope I didn't, I'm not gonna ask the question that you were just talking about um, as it relates to um, the industry kind of in general and the employees that work for people that that we may out you know outsource to what's the um, level of security and background checks and that kind of thing that's kind of standard in the industry because obviously they come into our world and we're very susceptible if you will I guess is maybe that's not the right word but to outside interactions so what, what's that what's that what's that world like um, or can you shed anything on that I didn't quite understand the question I'm sorry yeah I was afraid of that <laughs> um, not that you didn't understand that I didn't say it well, right I did that's really scary <laughs> well, that is scary <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I guess we're putting a lot of faith in the companies that we hire right. oh. to do services, but we're also have putting faith in their uh, ethics, their character of the company, but also the individuals. Mm -hmm. So in that world of IT, <laughs> how do they do those checks and background checks? And, and, and is that kind of at a higher level than the norm? Uh, I don't want to call it national security, but it is our national security that our systems are closely protected. and. We do that on our own employees, but you know, mm -hmm. I just just curious, you know. Yeah, there are uh, several standards that we rely on and build into our uh, um, competitive solicitations and bids that we can actually ask for that are like credentialing, if you will, for some of those um, uh, background checks and compliance requirements, and um, especially when you're talking about hosted systems, where you know they're they're responsible for the whole system. Uh, you know, there's attestations of compliance when we come to PCI. So there's a lot of things we do ask for when we engage an external service like that. Okay. So we kind of leave it up to them to do that, to, to take care of those background checks individually. We rely on the company to deliver that integrity. That's exactly, yeah. And you, you, uh, you require proof and documentation that it's happening. And they're all insured if there's a problem and that, that we can be protected. 
Yeah, that's absolutely a requirement with, with all of our uh, contracts. I would imagine, like any of our contracts yeah. that we have. Okay, thank you. Okay, Linda, go ahead. So that leads us into the decision packages that the department is proposing for FY22. BTS has um, proposed three decision packages, and you see them here starting at the bottom of page six in uh, ascending department rank order. The first one is 24-7 security operations service, and Jeff already uh, discussed this uh, somewhat. Um, this was the item he was talking about where they, um, they did research the potential of um, what it would cost if they did it in-house, and so uh, it it does uh, it, it did pan out that outsourcing is the most effective option for providing this service. And this service really um, it, this came from a security assessment that was completed uh, this year, this fiscal year, at, by an outside security consultant. And the findings revealed that there was a need for a security operations center that would operate 24/7. And this would help manage detection and response to detect attacks, and it would help manage uh, risks to prevent known attacks before they actually occur. Um, the costs for this in FY22 are expected to be about $316,000, and that includes onboarding and subscription fees. And then ongoing, it would be about $260,000 uh, for those subscription fees. Question real quick, um, and a lot of this is security w with our own systems. Um, and um, I know that there was some. I was at a meeting last night, and they were asking the city of Oldsmar uh, some of their issues that they had with their water system being, I guess, attacked, if you will. I don't even know what the right terms are, but um, we we engage in those protections with our utilities. Um, is that? We do all of that ourselves, um, and no, okay, no. Yeah. Yes, I'm hearing yes and no, so I just want to make sure I'm. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, you know, BTS is is partnered very uh, tightly with our utilities department around cybersecurity. Um, uh, you know, without getting too into the the, yeah, yeah, the weeds. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, right after the Oldsmar event, we we brought the whole team back together and came up with an action plan just to. Redouble our efforts and relook at all of the cybersecurity um, uh, opportunities that we have, and um, we've been working through an action plan. And you know, you can always get better, so we've been doing that. And um, uh, this specific uh, decision package, though, it, it is actually that. part of that for us because you know the Olsmar event could have happened over a weekend or at night, and and in that scenario, you know, you might not detect it until you're back during normal business operations and things like that. So, and also, you know, the water system is a 24 hour operation. So we need 24 hour security watching right. what's going on. Okay. So, uh, yeah. That, that's kind of where I was going with that. So that really is on it, It's we're, we're a big, obviously a big part of that whole protection sphere or whatever around our utilities. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and we do vulnerability assessments. I mean, those are that's where you stress test your system and things like that. Yeah, and I know we can't get into details. I was just curious. Thank you. Uh, the second decision package request, uh, and that is at the near the top of page seven, accessibility and ADA compliance tools. Uh, this cost for FY22 is expected to be about $135,000 and ongoing annual subscription costs would be $105,000. <clears> Pardon me. And this, uh, this would provide compliance tools and training to, ad to address accessibility issues. And the anticipated or expected outcome of implementing this decision package would be awareness and better understanding of the volume of those non-compliant documents and non-compliant public-facing content that we currently have. And uh, just want to note that that previously mentioned ADA uh, compliance, FTE, that uh, we talked about earlier in this presentation, um, this, that position is intended to establish the digital accessibility program for implementation throughout the county. And um, at present, that, the duration of that position is yet to be determined. And as Jeff mentioned, that's a, that's a temporary position. And so um, as the future department um, what would retain that function, so. 
how, how are we doing on that front as far as ADA accessibility to our systems? Well, we've made a, a tremendous amount of progress uh, from where we were, and um, each department has their own kind of churn on remediating uh, new content. Um, our new websites are, are um, really amazing, and they're and they're they're fully compliant. The real uh, challenge is the um, sheer amount of historical documents we have back going backwards to remediate those. So um, this particular request is is more around having the tools and training in the department's hands so that they can produce compliant uh, documents right when they're authored the first time versus having to remediate them after the fact. Um, but as far as to answer your question on, on how we're doing, I think um, each, each uh, constitutional and, and the divisions under the county administrator are all progressing nicely and our, uh, our uh, digital accessibility position um, came in and in, in the first 90 days we put together a solid uh, action plan and we were working through it. Okay, so, so we're making um, acceptable progress. Are there time restrict, uh, time um, deadlines that we have to make, uh, reach uh, on, on all of that effort? Yeah, we actually, uh, if, if you're speaking di directly related to the lawsuit and, and that timeline, we've just passed the end of that timeline where we are, um, we have our policy in place, we're implementing and, and uh, um, uh, you know, executing that policy. So we are, we are where we needed to be. That's great. Thank you. And the, the third decision package that BTS department is bringing forward is the Oracle ERP or Enterprise Resource Planning Modernization Release 2 of 3. Uh, this decision package is, for FY22 is estimated at just over $1.8 million. And uh, subsequent to that, there will be about $95,000 in annual ongoing maintenance and um, licensing fees. And the proposed solution is a complete upgrade of Oracle to version 12.2.10, and you may have already heard this fact, but um, ERP was in, originally installed in 2010 and has not been updated since that point in time. Um, in, this, uh, in this decision package that uh, the bullet points I've got here, the projected timelines in the total cost estimate, uh, the total project expenditure plan is just over four and a half million dollars. And so this release two of three is $1.8 million of that. And the timeline for release two is starting January of 2022 and continuing through September of 2022. This is a, this is a big deal <laughs> with where we're going with Oracle. Um, so Jeff, if you can just talk briefly about what we're doing now with the human um, resources component, okay? And, and how this fits in, because there's a lot more analysis that needs to occur strategically looking at Oracle and how much resources we put in, because it has an end, end of shelf life. Um, and these are major systems, but they're major disruptions in the implementation. Um, these are huge changes to business practices. So. Yeah, that's, thank you. <clears throat> that's exactly right. This, this, uh, the Oracle ERP system is our core financial system, payroll, um, human resources, advanced benefits, uh, purchasing and procurement. Um, this, this is a system that touches uh, so much of the county and when you make a change in this area, it is significant. There's a lot of testing the business units have to do. There's a lot of uh, organizational change management and, and training that has to be done. Um, but we also need to progress it to Barry's uh, point. This system, uh, if we did not upgrade it this year, would have ended life in December. Um, so we were up against really a, a, a critical time frame. We are going to be upgraded by July of this year, and uh, we'll, we'll be on the new version. And then we're committed to release one, which will get us uh, through the end of the calendar year, and will provide a lot of uh, enhancements and additional functionality uh, through the end of the calendar year. This decision package speaks to release two, which is continuing that effort 
and, and addressing some additional uh, several hundred pain points and inefficiencies and, and modernizing really in human resources and uh, um, finance and procurement. Um, those are the core areas of, of you know, enhancing and release too. Um, to, you know, this is a uh, multi-million dollar system. It's, a, it's estimated at about a six to $10 million replacement value. And, and if you look at your 10 year operating costs, it's, it's over $30 million in 10 year operating costs of a system this size. So these are big decisions, but we do have a roadmap and some options and um, we, would, we would anticipate having executive uh, review of that roadmap in the coming weeks and making a decision on this. And, and that's the reason I, I wanted him to outline that. These are huge decisions um, because you're putting a lot of money out. Well, do you go ahead and bid it out and start over again? Do you host it, you know, versus having it internal? Well, these decisions can't be made in a vacuum. Ken Burke, obviously, major, major, you know, player in that because of all the financial impacts. But, you know, when we started down this path, and you went to ERP systems, you really didn't have a lot of choices. You had to plug and play all the different components. Well, now we've already spun off the budgeting piece. We've already spun off a purchasing piece because they, they talk to each other. Systems used to didn't uh, not talk to each other. And so the, it's already changed in the environment. But these are major um, business, these has major business disruptions and change management that has to occur with the implementation. And so we really have to spend time, bring all the appointing authorities together to, to advise you in terms of uh, direction and where we're gonna go with it. Uh, that's the reason I was talking, so why it's so important to have that strategic plan uh, on these systems. I will tell you, you know, Oracle is, is what I implemented in 2002, um, and I said they can upgrade it after I leave, and I think they're doing that now because it's, it's a big deal. Um, you know, and, and they're, they're, we're in that same boat, you know, we have to make that decision. Thank you. Um, so moving on from the D BTS department uh, requested decision packages, at the bottom of se page seven, there's an item that, that we've titled additional request, and this is for awareness or information only, um, just to bring uh, to your attention that the state attorney's office has submitted a decision package, and you will most likely hear about that during their BIS, which I believe is June 16. And this is, it's called Case Management and Documentation Sharing System for Paperless Court. And um, it is a technology-related item, um, but it is for the state attorney's office and uh, really for, um, um, public defenders as well, and it allows them to access documentation really um, primarily um, electronically. So, it, uh, and COVID, uh, as I understand it, the COVID pandemic really brought home the fact that they didn't have that ability to access the documentation that they needed on an electronic basis. Uh, the state attorney's office has researched and they found a particular product called StackWeb that's uh, as they deem it the best and most cost-effective option. Uh, they are going to be requesting about $308,000 in FY22, and the ongoing annual maintenance cost will be about $142,000. And uh, as I also, as I understand it, this item was reviewed and supported by the CGIS Policy Board. Uh, Jeff, would you like to add some additional information for this? Yeah, this is, um, uh, here is informational, but you will see it uh, when the state attorney presents their budget proposal in front of you. The, um, the current system that we use today, our justice CCMS, is a consolidated court case management system. And the state attorney uh, uses that system but it really is only providing one function to their office in their day-to-day -day business, and that's really around uh, court cases that are in the criminal justice system. Uh, they've identified the need to really um, advance and modernize their entire operation and office, so that's what this is really more about. It will, to a certain extent, um, displace the functionality we provide today, and but we will need a linkage uh, between the, uh, the court system and this system. But this system really brings a paperless uh, operation to their to their office, 
It will also provide a client portal, so very seamless interaction with the clients and uh, e, -discover, <coughs> e discovery and sharing of information. So, you know, you will see this. We're, we're working now to understand the uh, touch points and where, uh, what functionality on our side would be displaced with the functionality on their side. Uh, just a quick question when it says state attorneys, um, research indicates. Um, is that just kind of an industry research? They don't. They don't have their own IT people. So, 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 just curious what they they actually polled um, uh, the majority of the state uh, uh, state attorneys in the state, and uh, I believe fifteen or eighteen other state attorneys are using okay. this this software product. So it, it kind of rose to the top. So kind of a qualitative mm -hmm. thing. And now, yeah, got it. Okay, thanks. Uh, I would like to orient you to attachment one in the Granicus item. Um, starting on page four are all of the decision packages, the three that BTS is putting forward. And we've also included this particular um, state attorney's uh, decision package as well. And that's on pages nine and 10. So it gives uh, quite a bit more information than what's included in these bullet points for your reading pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and finally, to, uh, to close out this presentation, a um, uh, little bit of information on their CIP, Capital Improvement Program. Um, BTS uses a slightly different funding strategy for CIP than what you may have heard from other departments that have already presented to you. And they, use, they fund it with a consistent dollar amount each year. And that annual funding was based on a multi-year projection of expenditures that was developed about 10 years ago. And the FY22 request uh, for CIP is consistent with that strategy. And uh, so far, BTS has been able to accommodate their CIP needs within that funding strategy. And their CIP needs are for end of life uh, replacements of pieces of equipment and growth expenditures. With the transition to cloud, um, we know that that's going to be a multi-year initiative. And um, as part of that, BTS feels that based on current projections, they will need to augment the CIP funding during the FY24 budget development process. So what they would like to do, and um, we fully support it, is to be in a better position prior to the FY23 budget preparation timeframe that we will reevaluate the BTS CIP funding um, from what was done 10 years ago and we'll try to right size it for the next five to 10 years so that it can accommodate the needs as we transition to cloud and then eventually pull out of our, um, our non-cloud type of equipment. And I will point out that uh, the CIP information and the dollars were already incorporated in the tables that uh, we've already discussed today. So the dollars by program for enterprise IT and custom IT, those dollar amounts do already include the CIP requests that they are making. And that concludes my portion of the presentation. So uh, I will uh, turn the mic back over to Jeff in case he wants to add some closing thoughts. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, before I uh, close out, I'd just really like to thank Linda and, and our entire OMB team. I think the partnership and uh, level of understanding and transparency between BTS and OMB is, is really progressed the last couple of years and it, it's, uh, it shows in our budget preparation. So appreciate your partnership. Um, you know, I, this is an exciting time in BTS. We are, we are in the middle of a digital transformation this transformation started this year and even a little bit a part of last year, but really this year in earnest. And um, the FY22 budget proposal that you're seeing is really a continuation of that. Um, we are, as we've already talked about, we're in the middle of modernizing our Oracle ERP system um, and upgrading it. It hasn't been upgraded in 10 years. This is a very, very large uh, effort. In parallel, we're upgrading our criminal justice case management system. And uh, these are two of the largest you know, systems in the county. There's very few as, as big as these two multi-million dollar systems. We're upgrading both in the same time. 
Uh, you know, we're also looking at the rest of our portfolio, and to Barry's point, we're working on a roadmap, and, you know, where do we take the rest of our applications? Uh, but between OTI and, and BTS, we're looking at some really neat solutions. Uh, there's like low code, no code options where we don't even need developers to provide a business application. We're looking at um, uh, cloud native development. So uh, a lot of transformation happening in our application space. Um, we also, BTS has just recently completed a pilot of a new business intelligence and data analytics platform. And this is built from the ground up on cloud technology partnered with Amazon. And, and it's really built on speed and scale at a really incredible price point. So this would be our, our future business intelligence platform for the next several years. Uh, so a lot happening there. You've heard about Okta and the application access portal and Microsoft Intune. These technologies are changing the end user experience. So one of the things about COVID is, you know, we had to quickly adapt to remote work. Um, but with these uh, end user experience enhancements, we're really trying to make end user experience seamless, whether you're here, whether you're at their home or at a conference or at Tallahassee, that experience needs to be seamless. Um, also next year in this budget is the selection and, and implementation of a brand new next generation telephone system for the county. Um, that's 7,000 phones that will be replaced, and that's, that's another one that's very impactful to the business, changing out the system. But this will change the way we communicate for the next decade and, and provide you know, very modern ways to communicate uh, and take us into the 2030s, which is interesting to think about. And then you know, our data centers are arguably state of the art, but we are also looking and keeping our eye on how cloud will impact that and, and when does that need change from you know, having these state of the art on-prem data centers. Um, so we wanna, we wanna keep that balance and, and keep that understanding. And then lastly, I can't not talk about cybersecurity. Um, the landscape is, is um, not getting any better. We need to continue to invest in it and you see that with our number one uh, decision package being around uh, a security operations center. Um, our ability to detect and respond is probably our number one need right now is the, you know, uh, so that we can, you have to assume that your protections are good, but then if they, if something gets through, you need to be able to detect it as quickly as possible and respond to it as quickly as possible to minimize the damage. So uh, continuing to invest in cybersecurity is, is front and foremost for us. And I will... Uh, thank you for your consideration and answer any questions if you have any. Um, just uh, probably it has nothing to do with this budget discussion today, but it's just, you know, in the news um, in terms of being held hostage by outside intervention and um, the, the, the ludicrous, the, oh, whatever the right word is, of, of, of responding in payment is nauseating uh, to me. But then again, you know, when you have a pipeline that's, you know, feeding gas to hundreds of millions or tens of millions of people, I, I, I get it. But uh, wh where do you see that, uh, just kind of a general industry direction and trend on that front? And how are we covered on that? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm very much against paying. I mean, paying is the wrong thing to do. It, it propagates the the behavior. And, um, you know, I hope everyone's doing their due diligence to prepare and, and, and you know, build in backup systems, build in uh, the people that pay, they pay because they lost their data. Uh, if you have your data, you can you can rebuild. It could be painful, but you can rebuild. If you lose your data and you lose your backups, you, you're going to pay because there's no alternative. Um, so uh, we we do have a cybersecurity workshop uh, next week on Wednesday with the BTS board. I, I would open an invitation to the other commissioners that aren't part of the BTS board if if you wanted to hear some of the uh, details behind that. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about. Uh, a recent security audit that was done by an independent third party and then our responses to that. And then also um, we're gonna talk about ransomware. 
so uh, okay. I think I think that would be a good opportunity if, if if you guys wanted to attend I would extend that opportunity okay thank you Commissioner Gerard you had a question <laughs> uh, this is probably a, a silly question but I'm not on the BTS board so um, on page two the combined budgets or the combined revenues and fund balance, there's a $7 million reduction in the fund balance for both, but then I don't see where, it's probably lost somewhere between the uh, BTS and OTI budgets, but I can't figure out where that's coming from. You are correct. It is um, a blend of both OTI department and BTS department um, as as they use the the dollars that are held in in reserves to uh, help cover what they've submitted so far. Um, if you if you like, I can do some research and uh, after this meeting and try to figure out how much of that might be split between the two departments and and provide that back to you. That would be great. Okay. Certainly. Any other questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm assuming we're still connected with uh, Commissioner Seal. I've been quiet, but there she is. There she is. Okay. If so, make sure you're connected. That's all. Can we ask her how she's feeling? Because I don't. Uh, Commissioner Long, um, well, we all would like to know how you're feeling. Are you feeling any better or the same? Um, maybe a tiny bit better. Thank you for asking. Um, I did have one, and maybe it's more appropriate to ask when we get to OTI, but, um, <clears throat> you know, we always kind of ask the question, were we better off financially and operationally before we split into BTS and OTI? And adding up the finances, um, it appears that we are not. So I guess that's maybe a question for Jeff. Um, maybe for Bill, you know, that was a big question when we did the split and went back into two departments back in fiscal 18. Well, that's a good transition question from BTS to OTI since it kind of include, includes them both. Thank you. Well, they're both there. <laughs> If I understood the, the question that re revolved around, are we are we neutral with the split from OTI and BTS still today? And um, I would I would have to partner with OMB to come up with that answer. But I would say the initial was neutral, and now we're two budget cycles or three budget cycles removed from that. So I don't know if we've maintained that kind of um, calculation. I would ask Bill's help on this one. Yeah, my response to that, and I've given this thought because I anticipated this question would probably come up, and it's a great question, is that it's neutral from the perspective of if we were to have continued to do exactly the same thing today as we had done back when we broke those two aspects out, where we took OTI and split out to serve um, as a department reporting directly to the county administrator. However, as you're well aware, on a continuing basis, we have new technologies that we're implementing to introduce efficiencies, introduce and be able to close security loopholes, uh, modernize uh, what we're using. And as a result of that, if we were to look at the budgets collectively of BTS and OTI and compare it to where they were prior to the split, it would absolutely be a higher technology spend in total. But that higher technology spend is intentional, strategic, and it's based on modernizing and continuing to improve how we use technology as an organization to serve our customers. So the likelihood is that if you would have, if, if you had stayed combined, you probably would have spent those same dollar, increased dollars anyway. That would be my perspective on it. I would. You know, offer for Jeff and Brian to be able to respond as the experts in these areas, but um, I feel that we've been pretty transparent uh, in the budget presentations um, and the budget development and in the contracts we bring forward when we are increasing our total technology spend due to the factors I described. 
Commissioner Seal. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner Seal. Thank you. So, you know, if you look back at fiscal 18 for BTS, it was about 23 million. In the fiscal year 22 request, is, um, I think without the decision package, was 43 million, almost 44 million. So it's about double. And I understand it is due to new technologies, but I just always want to make sure that we are being very efficient with our and in, in using effective systems as we move forward. Um, you know, technology is great, but only if it gets us some other efficiencies on the other end, which I'm not sure it really does. We all spend too much time on email and texting now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair? Yeah, Commissioner Long. Uh, so I would, uh, that begs me to ask Barry a question because since you've come on board, you've made a lot of substantial changes in a lot of departments based on experience you've had elsewhere. And this particular split happened under a different administration. So I'd be curious, uh, when you've had some time to think that through, if you have a different thought process with regard to how we handle all this stuff, and if it would more appropriately address Commissioner Seals' um, mm -hmm. concerns, because I remember making the comment when we, before we did the split, when we were talking about it, that because I know Commissioner Welch was all over this too, if you remember, because he was the techie guy on our commission. You know, that we knew then that advancing into this new territory of security and cybersecurity and all of the various other things that the new technologies bring to us was going to be incredibly expensive if we wanted to be the best of the best and be on the cutting edge with how we operate and conduct our business. But I agree with Commissioner Seals' concerns that from a human point of view, I do often wonder what the value is to our organization, given the fact that we're all, you know, held hostage mm -hmm. like we're all on crack to our cell phones. You can't get away from it, no matter where you are, no matter how hard you try to disconnect. We've gotten into a place where we're never disconnecting, and I don't know that it's healthy. Well, Lourdes I is right now because she said she's not taking her cell phone or anything with her. And, God uh, bless her. <laughs> but I, I wish I had a good answer for you. I, I, looking back over the last 20 years, um, you know, I've implemented an ERP system. Everybody said it's going to create more efficiencies. Well, uh, those efficiencies never materialized in reduction in staff, I can tell you that, um, because now you had to have specialization to be able to manage the, the modules that you implemented and that you didn't have before. So did, did, it, did we create more accurate records? and less mistakes and things like that, absolutely. We found, you know, up there, union contracts, we were in a, we were paying differently than what the contract said, you know? But it was because you did not, until you automate that, you don't know that. Um, I think it's just a new world um, in terms of that. I have not seen us have the ability to manage cost. I'm advocating for having more hosted solutions. That's more from a human resources standpoint in management and from a cybersecurity standpoint as much as anything. However, when you do that, you're beholden to them for licensing and they are not kind on the licensing <laughs> cost. It skyrockets. So, um, and I don't have a good answer for you. I think it's a, it's a new cost of doing business and I think it's a reality that we're, we're living in. Um, having the old legacy systems, that's where our vulnerabilities are. And so we can't be in that world anymore. And, and that's just the new reality. And so we have to think about that technology, but we have to build it in as a cost of doing business. It doesn't mean that we can't tell Jeff no every now and then. Um, and, you know, I think we do have to kind of manage that cost. I think the bigger thing we can do a better job of is forcing the cost benefit analysis and holding ourselves to account for the return on investment on the back end. That's, and, and you know, and, and so we have to continue to push for that. But 
uh, managing IT calls is not something that I've been successful with. But I think, if I can follow up, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I do think that we have a responsibility to our citizens to better educate them on where our dollars are going because you never hear in these public meetings as relating to our budget from citizens who want us to decrease services. What we hear is we want more, we want more, and we want more. But with all of that comes these enormous costs, and yet, you know, you, we all hear elected officials are all about cutting budget, cutting taxes, cutting this and cutting that. And so I don't think we are doing the best job that we could be in educating the enormous cost of providing the services and the quality of life that we do. I'm just going to leave it at that because I can I'll, talk I'll try to do us. a better job when I present the budget here in July because I'm sure um, that's exactly what we're going to deal with. <laughs> we want well, we I, want more, and we want less. Do you not taxes, agree? So, yeah, anyway. I, I, I would, and I think the question that Commissioner Seal was asking yep. originally, and, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but um, there's a there's a, been an increase yep. from what, what 23 to 43 million. Some of that was going to happen uh, regardless of whether we split the, the 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 organizations. And I think the question is is was the split a good move yeah. it, just on that basis alone. So, you know, maybe think, would yeah. we be in a better place or right. worse place? Are we would have spent more or spent less because of the split, not because of the way the technology and the way the industry is moving? Those are two and different. that's what I was trying to get at. I think Bill's, you know, analysis would be that you would have spent it anyway, um, that those costs were not related to having two separate groups, but just the, the cost of technology and, and, and upgrades and and everything associated with that. Um, that's that's what I heard him shaking his head on. Yeah, and, and, and I think if that's the case, then that answers the one question, but I think Commissioner Long, Commissioner, uh, the, some of the comments that have been made, making sure obviously that we understand that, but that our, 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 our residents understand the fact that the numbers are mind boggling in this industry, yep. uh, just because it is the nature of the industry. and. So keeping them up to speed on what we're doing and how we're doing it, and it may not be the, the, the I guess, the most fun thing to hear about, but I think a lot of our residents are pretty savvy when it comes to technology, and they'll certainly understand, if not appreciate, um, the investment that we're doing in all of this to, 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 to do a better job records. on their behalf. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're doing is. So um, yep. anyway. If we can um, move on, then yeah. we'll, we'll go to OTI. And um, first up is Krishna. Go ahead. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Krishna Gandhi, a budget analyst with the Office of Management and Budget. Today I'm joined by Belinda Adminson, who's the SPM analyst, and we have Brian Zumwalt, who's the director of the department. The Office of Technology and Innovation was created in FY18 by realigning positions from BTS, and the department is responsible for providing IT and business application services to the BCC departments. The Office of Technology and Innovation assists departments in finding technology efficiencies that result in improved performance. This requires the department to balance priorities ensuring funding is available as well as staff having skill sets needed to provide technical expertise. The staffing summary reflects a decrease of four FTE in FY22, and these are the four BTS positions that were funded by the City Works implementation budget, and with the completion of City Works nearing, these four positions will be funded in the, by BTS <coughs> in FY22. The total department's budget reflects a decrease of $3.5 million compared to the FY21 budget. The department's budget is broken up into three functions. The first function is the Office of Technology and Innovation, which represents the staff and related operational expenses for ongoing software support. In the first half of FY21, the department received seven business critical service requests, and the department was able to resolve 85.7% of these requests within the four-hour target. During the same period, the department also received seven degraded services re requests and was able to resolve 71.4% of these requests within a 24-hour target period. In this area, the personal services 
are, costs are increasing by $608,000 compared to FY21. And that's because $481,700 are dollars of the increase is from realigning six positions that are going from being project funding to ongoing operations after the implementation of City Works is completed in February of 2022. And the remainder of the increase is due to inflationary increases and career ladder implementations. The second function of the department is the BCC strategic projects, which represents the costs associated with developing and implementing new software solutions. An update on the Acela project, for Acela permitting project, that project is gone live, that module. The Acela module for consumer protection is anticipated to go live in September 2021, and the Acela module for the contractor licensing department has been delayed to October 2021 to avoid conflict with the department's peak license renewal season, which ends in September. It was determined that Acela is not uh, does not meet the requirements for animal services, so the implementation of that module is not taking place. The FY22 budget for this area is $2.7 million, which is a decrease of $4.4 million compared to the FY21 budget. In this budget includes the remaining implementation costs of CityWorks and the Acela module for contractor licensing department as well as $1 million for unspecified projects that are approved by the BCC executive leadership team. Any unspent funds from the unspecified project budget is accumulated within the BTS fund reserve for the Cheetahs upgrade project implementation, which is anticipated in FY23. The Cheetahs is the medical record software that is utilized by Human Services and the Department of Health. The third function is the Enterprise License and Maintenance Support Services, which represents the recurring software licenses and maintenance for software solutions. As part of the department's strategic goal to retire legacy on-premises data center systems, the shift to cloud software will result in an increase to the o OTI budget over time and a decrease to the BTS budget as less on-premises services are utilized. The FY22 budget for this cost center reflects an increase of 290,000 compared to the FY21 budget. A large portion of this increase is due to the annual license rate increases and increase in the number of licenses, with a small portion of the increase attributed to new software licenses added in FY22. Now I'll turn it over to Belinda to cover the department's decision packages. Thank you, Krishna, and good morning. Uh, the department has a few decision packages this year, and these are starting at the bottom of page three. The first decision package is for Amazon Web Services cloud hosting. Uh, Amazon Web Services provides on-demand cloud computing platforms that are built only based on usage. Uh, this decision package directly aligns with the department's strategic goals to modernize the county's application portfolio and to seek vendor-supported cloud-based solutions and also to retire legacy on-premises data center systems. Uh, essentially, the cloud hosting services uh, eliminates the need for on-premises servers, storage, electricity, physical space, and personnel. Amazon Web Services provide on-demand cloud computing that is based, again, only on usage. We anticipate the cost for these services not to exceed 100,000 in FY22. Uh, there would be an aux an expected offset to this cost, as I mentioned earlier, by the reduction of equipment, physical storage space, and the personnel needed to maintain on-site servers. This offset, however, is information that we don't have just yet. Um, I would like to add that this decision package is part of the strategic issue that Barry and Jeff mentioned earlier to balance in-house versus on-premises services. The second decision package, which starts on page four, is related to this, the first decision package and is for um, Amazon Web Services Consulting Services. Uh, this would be for a consultant related to the services, which is being requested for staff training, system optimization, and architectural support for these services. Uh, the consulting services are anticipated to be for one year only, and this is to allow staff to become self-sufficient on the Amazon platform and this would be a non-recurring cost of just under $250,000 in FY22. The, uh, 
The last decision package is for Redmark Technologies as needed support services. Redmark is used to develop the Acela Civic platform across the departments. Uh, funding for the project did not include ongoing support or contingencies, and as a result, we are requesting non-recurring funding of about $40,000 uh, to support services for a cell of configuration, scripting, and integrations in FY22. I'd also like to note that these services would only be utilized if support services cannot be performed in-house. And as far as COVID impacts, very similar to BTS, most staff members within the department continue to work from home, and the department has experienced success in adopting this model as far as the work product and productivity. And now I'll pass this off to Brian if you have further questions or comments. Thank you, Belinda. Thanks, Krishna. Uh, commissioners, it's nice to see you all in person uh, rather than virtually the way that we did for about six months. Um, I also want to thank, thank Jeff uh, and his staff. You know, BTS has been a great partner to OTI since we were a department in fiscal 2019 when we first became a department. Um, you know, our department has done many, many things in the first three years that we've been a department. Uh, I, I put together a little list here, just, just if you'll in, indulge me for about 15 seconds. We've had new asset management system, new permitting system, new budgeting system, new procurement system, new utility billing system, park reservation system, performance management system, medical examination forensic system, uh, special needs registration for emergency management. Um, we've been very busy in the first you know, couple years that we've been in existence. And these, all of these applications are modernized, um, mostly cloud-based applications that we now support uh, on behalf of the departments under the, the, the BCC. So i um, very, very proud of our team. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Jeff and BTS for their partnership because we can't do this without them, obviously. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions about the budget and the requests. Okay. Well, thank you, Krishna and Belinda, both. And, and also, you, any, any, anybody, anybody have any questions uh, for Brian or? I guess not. Great. We're good. We're back on track. All right. <laughs> back Thank you, Brian. Room. Thank you. All right. Next up is Office of Asset Management. And this is also Krishna, so go ahead. Yes, today I'm joined with Shane Kunza, who's the SPM analyst, and Jeremy Waugh, who's the director of the Office of Asset Management. The Office of Asset Management is responsible for the implementation and maintenance of the Enterprise Asset Management Program with the goal of improving the effectiveness and efficiency of asset management throughout the entire asset life cycle. The Office of Asset Management staff have collaborated with the Office of Technology and Innovation to develop some critical reports. The department is on track to publish the annual cost of asset ownership and asset inventory reports in FY21. These reports will allow trend analysis against FY20 baseline data that has been collected. The department is also on track to publish the energy use report for enterprise asset management program in October of 2021. This report will reflect current energy consumption and conservation initiatives. In FY22, the staffing summary is, uh, or the staffing levels are increasing by a quarter FTE for temporary city works end user training support. This temporary position is funded by the city works implementation budget, and once the training is completed, the position will be removed. Move into the budget summary at the top of page two. The FY22 expenditures reflect a net decrease of $24,340. The FY22 personal service budget reflects an increase of $13,350 for inflationary increases and capital outlay budget reflects an increase of about $8,400 for scheduled PC replacements. The increase to personal services and capital outlay are offset by the decrease in FY22 operating expenses of $46,000, which is due to removing non-recurring budget items. The Office of Asset Management expenditures are allocated as internal governmental charges to departments that receive services from the Office of Asset Management and are collected as revenue in the general fund. Now I'll turn it over to Jeremy for an update on the Enterprise Asset Management Program. Good morning. Thank you, Krishna. Um, 
I've heard uh, through many of the, the sessions that I listened to on Wednesday, which are most of the departments we support along with the DAS department to represent today. Um, and we're really here supporting them um, and their capital planning, their infrastructure management needs. Um, and you heard mention that the two reports that we're gonna be building for uh, asset inventory and cost of ownership. And really, that's what we're here to do. I heard the comment earlier, how are we proving that we're gonna be more efficient? That's what we're here to strive to do, is to not only just implement these new technologies, but prove how we're going to be um, measuring our efficiency using those across those five departments here in the future. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions you have. Uh, we will be live, uh, I think you heard that on Wednesday as well. The track two departments uh, will be live by the end of this calendar year in February 22 uh, will be the end of the, the implementation phase and will be fully alive with all of the departments. Uh, just so you know the scope of that, that's about 1,100 county users of daily use of this software package. Uh, so using this new tool that our partners in BTS and uh, OTI have, will help support from a technology standpoint. Okay, anything else, um, Krishna? Good, any questions? Okay. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Next up is marketing and communications. Actually, I just communications. They're going through a rebranding. And for this, we're going to start off and let Patrick get set up. And he is also a new analyst to OMB. And so uh, we'll let, uh, after he's ready, um, you can get started. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Patrick Didiana, and I am the budget analyst for marketing and communications. Um, with me, I have Shane Coons, our strategic performance management analyst, and Barbara Hernandez, director for marketing and communications. Today, we will be discussing agenda item 21-867A, marketing communications, FY22 budget information session. Marketing and communication department strategically manages Pinellas, Pinellas County government communications by informing and engaging the public and partners across multiple mediums. The, co the communications department mission is to deliver communications that empower citizens and build trust in Pinellas County government. Before we dive into the numbers, I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss the impact COVID has had on the department. Since March 2020, marketing communications has led the, the the countywide COVID-19 pandemic communications response, booking a little over 17,000 hours from April 2020 to April 2021, which has resulted in several accomplishments. Highlights of those accomplishments can be found on page three of your document in the COVID-19 performance impact section. Those accomplishments include developing the Pinellas County COVID-19 response and recommendations website, Setting up, setting up virtually and socially distanced BCC meetings per CDC guidelines, managing the face mask distribution partnership with libraries in FY20, which distributed over 200,000 face masks to local residents. And finally, hosting an award-winning behavioral health program with directions for living to promote an emotional support line. The department continues to play a critical role in distributing COVID-19 public information Including the, including the launch of the Vaccine Partner Competence Toolkit in April 2021. Moving forward, let's take a closer look at, at the budget. Let's, we'll start with staffing. We'll start with staffing. Hang, hang on. Yes. Uh, hold oh, on one sorry. second, Patrick. Um, I just think maybe this is a good time to just, and again, I'm just off the cuff here. Maybe you could speak a little bit to the effort I mean, we talked yesterday a little bit about the effort of all of our employees this past year, but I, I think that our communications department was just unbelievable. Um, I don't want to want to get into all of it because I'm going to cut her uh, short of 
of the kudos that the group deserves and needs, but maybe you could speak a little bit to the Herculean effort I think that was needed. And, you know, with all of that said, I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, we just, you know, it's like we still can't ever get enough across to our residents. I mean, it takes two, our communication and everybody's listening. But I was just, I was just been, I've been overwhelmed with the the, group, the effort this group has made. So please, if you can make a few comments about that. I'd be very proud to make a few comments. Um, you know, you, you look at an effort and you see people, you know, actually doing the work, giving the shots, doing that. But there's a lot of support functions that without their efforts wouldn't allow the rest to take place. So the public communications piece was a huge piece in that. Um, pr trying to set up imp uh, information that people can grasp and put it in an easily, you know, to read format. And, and having to get it from multiple sources. You know, it doesn't come to you just fed the way that you see it distributed. And you also, you know, typically got Barbara's updated about midnight. You know, I, I saw it the next morning, okay? <laughs> Unless I couldn't sleep. So, um, you know, I mean, they're, throughout this effort, they've been right there as a a, a strong partner in this entire effort um, and and work diligently to try to make things better. Yeah. Um, you know, when we were thinking about, think about early on, just trying to get information out, um, trying to uh, figure out exactly how to, and everybody had their own idea about communication and what source was important. And they have to decipher that and, and make some decisions, <laughs> you know? And so um, they, they have been a great partner. Um, I actually, got to work a lot closer with them as a result of this. Um, and, you know, and I, I just saw how, how important and how um, hard they work. So, yeah, um, great, great, great effort. And uh, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, I, I just, uh, from, from the standpoint of just communicating with our residents through emotional, highly charged, emotionally charged times. It wasn't just like business as usual communication, which is complicated and you know, all of that, but trying to de determine the pieces that we needed to get across, but also listening to what people were looking for, because it was a, you know, just di dynamically changing every day, uh, weekly, monthly. I mean, the things and the reports and the community. So it just, it was a very complicated time, a complex time, a very emotional time. And uh, so anyway, I don't want to say, you know, go on and on, but I just really wanted to take a minute to acknowledge your group. Um, I know the rest of the commission feels identically about about that. And so um, we'll get back to you, Patrick. I think he was had wrapped up. <laughs> Not a lot of it, new issues in terms of our budget this year, but. Thank you, thank you. So we will now begin looking at the staffing, which begins on page one of the BIS document report you received. The staffing su summary shows no increase or decrease in the FTE count for FY22. As you can see, the FTE count has remained stable since FY18 with only one increase, with only one increase in FY20, but was reduced back in FY21 and for, will remain the same for FY22. Moving forward, we will now discuss the budget summary, which starts on the bottom of page one with the expenditure table and goes on to page two. Despite all the challenges the pandemic brought forth, they have delivered a $3 million budget, which represents a slight 2.3% increase over FY21. Although personnel services increased 2.3% due to the annual budgeted 3% pay adjustment, a 3.9% 3, 3 decrease in operating expenditures helped offset the overall increase. The remainder of that overall 2.3% increase is driven by a $17,000 dollar expend uh, increase in capital outlay for scheduled replacement of personal computers as identified by BTS. For marketing and communications, technology is one of the primary cost drivers for, for their operating budget. For FY22, we have two examples. The first one is Cision. With the previous cost of 6,200, the Cision software will be replaced by Meltwater and budgeted for by the Office of Technology and Innovation, thus reducing their operating budget by 6,200. This software will provide a more robust set of tools to track Pinellas County's media coverage and calculate total advertising value, value equivalent, equivalency, commonly referred to as AVE. AVE is based on total mentions, reach, and the value coverage. For FY20, 
marketing, marketing communications had an AVE of, of 78.2 million. The department is currently up 26.7% 20, for quarter one and quarter two of FY21, which equals 38.7 million. When compared to quarter one and quarter two of, F, of um, FY20, which was 28.4 million. The other, the other um, software we have is the expenditures related to live chat. Expenditures related to live chat increased the operating budget by 5,900. This, this, in, this increased expenditure, excuse me, aligns with the growth in live chat interactions. Live chat is the prefer, preferred method for citizen contact and expenditures related to live chat, related to live chat to accommodate the increased usage by our residents in FY20 and FY21. The table at the bottom of page two shows the growth in, inter in interactions increased by 22.6% in FY21 compared to the first two quarters of FY20. Furthermore, if you follow me to the, to the table at the top of page three titled Pinellas County Social Media Engagements and Video Views, you can see Pinellas County Social Media Engagements and Online Video Views experiences significant increases starting in the second quarter of FY20 and into FY21 due to the pandemic. This growth suggests that users feel marketing communications content is worth clicking on, viewing, and sharing. It also reflects an increased reliance on digital platforms by our residents, especially during times of crisis. Marketing communications is currently developing a new Pinellas County website and expects to launch it in 2021. The department expects to complete the content, the content template and admin configuration soon and, co I'm sorry, and complete content migration, quality assurance, and user testing in September 2021. The, the department could launch the website as early as September 2021. However, delays in content migration could force the timeline to launch in December of 2021. Marketing and communications is bringing on six temporary staff to aid in, in the content migration. The cost of that temporary of that temporary staff is sixty four thousand five hundred, and is budgeted and was budgeted out of OTI's FY twenty one strategic uh, projects budget. To wrap things up, marketing con marketing communications COVID nineteen response efforts have demonstrated the department is evolving to include more digital and external facing operations and as a result has increased the level of service for communication for communications residents have grown accustomed to in recent months. The community outreach program has also expanded exponentially this year, this past year, strengthening partnerships with residents in the Vietnamese, African American, and Hispanic communities, among others. Moving forward, the department will work uh, on an overall public engagement strategy for the organization in, in advancement of its mission to empower the residents and continue building trust. Okay, and thank that, you. Thank yes. you, Patrick. Um, Barbara, you're on. Thank you so much. Um, I, I know Shane had some performance measure items, so feel free to jump in. I'm just going to share a little bit. Um, so. Uh, Thank you, uh, Chairman Eggers. I want to take just a quick moment to first and foremost thank everyone in this room. We've been working together um, like we never had <laughs> in the time I've been here, but definitely my team deserves a great deal of credit for what we have been able to accomplish. Um, I looked at the numbers and the total hours for COVID response, and it's the equivalent of having added eight FTEs to our department, and my team was able to absorb that, take care of the COVID response, and still do the work that was needing to take, we needed to take care of. Um, some, of the, some of the things that I wanted to highlight, obviously the coordination with our uh, regional uh, public information network and the municipalities and local agencies was humongous and they were tremendous partners, so I wanna recognize that. Um, one thing um, under our public information team that uh, Patrick mentioned that I thought was just stellar was our first ever Facebook Live um, with Directions for Living. Um, in the week and a half prior to that event, they had been getting an average of eight calls a day to their emotional support line. The day after we did the Facebook Live, they got just that day 124 calls. Um, so that shows a little bit of the impact um, 
of what our team was able to accomplish um, with Directions for Living. Um, our social media specialist, he became a customer service uh, representative as well when people starting, uh, started direct messaging him. Um, just as an example, in January, he had 200 direct messages to respond to, in addition to everything else that, that he was doing. Um, our design teams, our um, uh, staff assistants, their uh, live chats went through the roof. Um, about 40% of the live chats that we got were COVID related. So that's about 2,600. And there's a lot of back and forth in each one of those. Um, certainly um, our marketing staff, our public information, um, but critically important, our broadcast team. They were the ones who made sure that we were able to meet here and every cable, every uh, monitor, every microphone uh, connected properly. And this was usually in a matter of a couple of hours, or, or if we were lucky, a few days. Um, so thank you for your trust in our team. Thank you, Barry, for your leadership. Um, and, and just, I have the best team. <laughs> Barbara, what was those numbers again on the, on the uh, directions for a living, the, the before and after? Sure. I, yeah. So a week and a half uh, before we held the Facebook Live, they were getting an average of eight calls a day on their emotional support line. This was at the beginning of the pandemic, they were offering this resource. Mm -hmm. People could call and talk to someone about what they were going through. The day after we held the Facebook Live event, they got 124 calls. Um, they had some client conversions. I, I know for a fact of one mother who became a steady client after calling and participating. Um, and she basically said, this gave me the coping skills I needed to you know, get through it with my kids. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any questions uh, for Barbara? Okay. Shane, did you have anything else uh, to add? I didn't. I didn't want to cut you all short. I don't. Uh, no, sir. Not at this time. Okay. Patrick covered the majority of it for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Barbara? Thank you. Thanks. All right. Okay. Next up, we have administrative services. So we'll get Joe Laura up here. right along and Patrick still on once again good morning good morning <laughs> um, as as you know I am the budget analyst for the Department of Administrative Services once again Shane is here Shane Coons is here as our strategic performance management analyst and we also have Joe Laurel Depart uh, director for the department uh, we will be discussing um, agenda item 21-866A, uh, Department of Administrative Services, FY22 budget information session. As you know, the Department of Administrative Services, which I will refer to DAS, uh, DAS moving forward, <laughs> is comprised of three divisions, purchasing and risk management, facilities and real property, and fleet. Together, the, the departments provide services pertaining to the legal and ethical procurement centralized services for real property, facility operations, maintenance, fleet asset management, fuel operations, and the mitigation of financial loss through a centralized risk management program. Let's begin with the staffing summary, which starts on page one. From FY21 to FY22, the DAS was reduced by 13 FTEs as the result of the Star Center Operations and Maintenance Program moving to economic development. Prior to the upcoming FY22 proposed budget, as I mentioned in the footnote at the bottom of page one, we will, re we will be reducing that FTE count by one more, specifically in purchasing and risk management, as part of the department's plan to implement a third party administrator for workers' compensation claims. We will have an additional reduction of two more FT FTEs after the onboarding with the TPA is completed in FY22, but those FTE reductions will be reflected in the FY23 budget. We will now move into the budget summary by fund and program section of the report you received, which starts on page two. The budget summary by fund and program section is organized, is organized by the three funds utilized to support the specific DAS programs. The first, fund, the first fund we will review is the general fund. The general fund supports two programs, facilities and real property and procurement. We'll, let's be, we'll begin with facilities and real and the real property program and look at expenditures first, which starts on page two. 
The Facilities and Real Property Program oversees facility operations and maintenance, and maintenance for all county government and court buildings, including the detention facility operated by the Sheriff's Office. Overall expenditures increased 3.1%. Expenditures for personnel services increased 2.2% and aligned with the 3% pay adjustment. New hires for recent vacancies starting at the entry point of the pay grade helped offset the 3.0% pay adjustment. Capital outlay expenditures decreased 22.9% due to decreases in tool purchases and in the number of scope and in the number and scope of planned building improvements that are not CIP. Operating expenditures did increase though. We see a 4.2% increase, almost 1.1 million. 93% of that increase is driven by budgeted COVID expenditures. The COVID expenditures were initially based on four months of FY21 actuals for PPE, sanitizer, UV lighting, and, inc and increased janitorial services. However, with increasing vaccinations and updated CDC guidelines, staff is inventorying current PPE supplies, reviewing the levels of service for COVID-related janitorial services, and believes we will reduce that number by 50% for the upcoming proposed budget. On page three of your document, you will find the revenue table for this program and fund. Overall revenues are projected to increase 46.9%. The new revenue is generated by lease payments from the tax collector's office for their new mid-county service center. These lease payments offset the costs incurred by the county in, in, purchase, in purchasing the facility and are consistent with lease payments, payments previously made by the tax collector prior to the owner. Charge for service revenues associated with the water chiller and user fees for petition to vacate and release of property interest increased 3.7%. This increase aligns with, the projected, with projected usage and contracted capacity fees for the chiller. While the FY22 budget is similar to past years minus the COVID impact, the results of two studies may have significant impact on operational performance and, ultim and ultimately the way this program is budgeted for in future years. Those two, those two studies are the Stantec study and the Collier study. The Stantec study will conduct, will conduct a space study and recommend which county properties to consolidate and reduce in relation to function while maximizing efficiencies. This initiative required an adjusted timeline, however, is, is on track to be completed and presented to the BCC on September 2nd, 2021. The other study, the Collier study, will review and assess over 500 Pinellas County owned properties. Colliers will assess the county, will assist the county with identifying and negotiating property acquisition and disposition as they relate to targeted county needs. So essentially, as, these, as we review these studies and recommendations come, we can potentially see quite a bit of different changes to this budget. The pro, the, yeah, yes. Um, just, uh, just an update, if you don't mind, on the, um, the sheriff's building. I, I, I drove by that recently. I, <laughs> I don't know when it was completed, but it looks fantastic. I'm assuming everything has gone well and Absolutely. we are good to go. If you could it's just. It's going very well, in fact, Commissioner, yeah. yes. Yeah, no. Mr. Yes. And, uh, hi, Joe. Hi, Commissioner. Uh, did you take care of the peeling paint or the paint that wasn't, because it does look good. I was out there the other day. Ab absolutely, that building's been, been stripped down, sealed, and totally repainted with real quality paint. And the sheriff so, is happy. Yeah, the staff seems to be very And no happy leaks with it. in the windows. Not yet, we haven't seen any yet. <laughs> we haven't had a lot of tests on that, have we? <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, sir. And, uh, and then just real, a quick comment, uh, you, you mentioned that chiller, that new chiller system in downtown, um, and what capacity is it running? Um, it, it, it has much more capacity than we're currently using it at, to be honest with you, Commissioner, that, that chiller's been online now about seven years, I believe, off the top of my head. And we are trying to find more customers. In fact, the church right next to the um, utilities building is interested in hooking up to that. So it, de it definitely has more capacity. Is it something that could be used for a new, uh, like the, a new government center? I know that Clearwater's looking oh, sure. at something with, so it could be partnered with those. Absolutely, okay. yes. 
Okay. It has a lot of capacity. There are pipes that run north and south and east and west all through down, downtown that if somebody had an interest in hooking up, they would just have to pay the fee to hook up to it. But yeah, okay. it has much, much more capacity. Commissioner Long. So that brings me to ask, have you connected with the city of St. Petersburg? Because there's so much new development going on down there. It occurs to me that there's some great synergies that could be taking place with those developers if they knew they could tie into our system. Well, yeah, we're talking about the system no, of downtown. This isn't Clearwater. Clearwater. This is yeah. a downtown. Oh, I thought this, you said downtown St. Pete. No, I, if I did, I meant downtown Clearwater. I apologize. Um, I'm yeah. so sorry. That's yeah. okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a long. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, for some reason, I thought we had a backup system down there, or is that just for the 911 center? No, we actually have a chiller at the 501 building that takes care of that campus, but I know of no other centralized it doesn't have any additional capacity no no oh. that's pretty old yeah okay sorry that's okay okay go, go ahead on procurement sorry about that thank you all right uh, the procurement information begins on page four the procurement program serves as a centralized purchasing function for the BCC and select constitutional officers overall expenditures for purchasing increase 4.1 percent the main drivers behind the increase include a $10,380 increase for professional development and training to ensure staff is leveraging current industry practices and technology to procure the most competitive bids. We also see a $5,000 increase in capital outlay to, repa to replace aging laptops and outdated docking stations as identified by the BTS device refresh program. However, the main, the, the main driver behind that increase is a $101,000 increase in the intergovernmental risk finance charge. This charge previously did not reflect the combining of the two divisions in FY20. This correction now factors in the salaries for a division manager and one admin support position that helps support the procurement function. In an effort to offer more efficient purchasing services, the Purchasing and Risk Management Division licensed by speeds procurement software for a total cost of $169,700. The new software will be, paid, will be paid by the Office of Technology and Innovation's FY22 budget. DAS intends to develop key performance measures and that track the software's effic efficiency and determine possible uh, process choke points. Moving forward, we will now be looking at the, the, the Fleet Asset Management and Fleet Fuel Program which begins on the bottom of page four. These programs provide for the acquisition, deployment, maintenance, repair, and disposal of county-owned vehicles, heavy equipment, and stationary engines. In addition to asset management, these programs also support the purchase of fuel and maintenance to the county's 17 fuel sites. Let's now look at expenditures, which begin on page five. Overall expenditures increased 7.7%, with the largest increase, 12.1%, occurring in operating expenses. Some of the drivers behind the increase in operating expenses include a $293,760 expenditure to manage and centralize all GPS services for the county under one department. Installation of the new GPS devices are expected to be installed on vehicles by December 2021 and will be funded by the FY21 budget. With GPS services centralized under one contract, Fleet will ensure all maintenance and software remains current. The GPS devices will also provide data for vehicle and equipment usage, including driver behavior, engine idling, and generator downtime. This data will be useful in improving asset care driver behavior, and creating future performance measures. With the cost of fuel rising, Fleet has increased the fuel markup by one cent. The additional one cent markup, combined with a projected increase in the number of gallons consumed, increased the, full, the fuel expenditure by $190,280. Additional increases for expenditures such as parts and outside fleet services beyond our scope of services also drove the remaining increase. Although operating expenses increased, personnel services and capital outlay decreased. 
Personnel services decreased 2.3% due to turnover and filling those positions at a lower rate of pay. Capital outlay decreased 13.5% due to a $600,000 reduction in the capital costs associated with the vehicle replacement program. This year's vehicle replacement program will purchase less vehicles and less heavy equipment in comparison to FY21. Yes, uh, Commissioner Law. This paragraph brings me to a really huge point that I know you, some of you have heard me talk about over and over and over again. I don't see one word in this paragraph about the improvements in sustainability and resiliency, nor do I see any, um, any word in there that speaks to, especially when it comes to the fuel, how we're working to change our fleet from whatever it is now to the newest technologies. And <laughs> I saw you yeah. nod your head, Joe, but I want you to know that there are new technologies that are mm -hmm. specific to mm -hmm. quote unquote heavy equipment. Mm -hmm. And you know I'm on the board at PSTA and we've talked about that a lot and we have a huge contract that we have just, and Commissioner um, Gerard as well, we have a huge contract that we have just approved to, for 10 years with the Jolly Trolley. And part of that contract was to, they were gonna purchase an enormous number of new Jolly Trolleys and they were all gonna be diesel. And so my whole point in that meeting was either we believe and value what we've been saying when it comes to uh, reducing our carbon footprint or we don't. So why are we not mandating that if they purchase oh. new vehicles under our contract that they go with electric? And guess what? That we th that brought a screech and halt to that contract and they went back and revisited it and now they're all going with electric vehicles. Um, so, so look at the next paragraph, okay, which is the Novak Consulting contract. One of the things we move for, okay, in looking to the future is it's not what you buy, it's the infrastructure to support it. And so we have to be strategic in terms of we're gonna go all electric or do diesel con converts on our heavy equipment or whether we're gonna do it at the time of replacement. That has to be a strategic decision made and I gotta have the support assets, including mechanics and others to support those assets. That's the reason we engage in looking at our whole fleet. And so that's part of the strategic look at the way we do our fleet operations. Follow up, Mr. Chair, please. I hear what you're saying, and I've been doing government and public policy work for a long time. There's a new sheriff in town, in case you haven't been paying attention, and that's the new CEO at Duke Energy, who made very specific her top three priorities and it was uh, renewing the, or upgrading the grid to, re to uh, take advantage of new technologies, ensuring that charging stations and the, what you just talked about, Barry, in terms of the infrastructure for support, uh, the, the new electric cars coming on the market was all in place, and so um, I would suggest that this consulting firm, if they're not talking to Duke and how we can integrate and partner with them, shame on us because well, I promise you this is not going to go so, away. So let's, let's, but let's frame the conversation in a positive light. Okay, we had this conversation. We actually implemented charging stations you can see in the parking lot as we leave here today. That was a result of our conversation we had two years ago. Um, so we began going down that path, looking at our technologies and looking forward on how we do these things. Um, and Hank is intimately involved in the whole fleet study and where we're going with technology and how do we support that. Um, because just throwing out technology, I drove a compressed natural gas vehicle in 1998 when I was a director of environmental services, but I had nowhere to fill it up. 
<laughs> I had one spot in all of Cincinnati. Okay, you've got to have the infrastructure. We got to be strategic in our investments. This is my only point. So we're doing that. It was the result of the board's direction that we started down this path, and so we're bringing that forward, and that'll be, that's part of our sustainability plan that Hank is working on with administrative services. So we heard you, and we're working on it. Well, I, I, I'm so pleased to hear you say that, Barry, if I may, Mr. Chair. <laughs> However, we are in the third day of sitting here at rapt attention, listening to one presentation after another, and then none of them has this issue been in writing? So if we, I hear what you're saying, but I want to see it in writing to know that you really mean it and this is something we're really going to focus on. And I'm not well, upset or angry or whatever. <laughs> I'm just really passionate about this issue. And yeah. I don't have 50 more years to work on it. Neither do I. <laughs> we are working on it. Well, I, and again, I think, and again, I'm going to, the only thing I would say, I'll get to just one second, is that. This takes some time. It takes some transition, and I am not going to. I am not going to support paying forty thousand dollars more for a vehicle because it's a certain type of vehicle over another one. Now, the rest of the board, that's, we'll have individual decisions on that. But I want realism. I want transition. I want infrastructure. I want all of that to be taken into consideration. I know we all know where the world is going. I mean, even, you know, the, 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 the Detroit and all of that, they're moving in a direction that we're going to have to be able to work with over time, no question about it. But it's not going to happen overnight, um, and I do think that we're at least on the path of, of a, addressing those transitions, and I think responsibly as opposed to doing it uh, too expensively. But, you know, we may have a difference on that. So, yeah, back at you. So um, anyway, um, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I uh, have been a part of those conversations with T. Barter and PSTA, and they have moved forward um, strategically because, as you said, Mr. Chairman, one of the concerns from Brad was whether or not we had the infrastructure by which to charge those uh, electric trolleys if, in fact, we purchased them. Um, the other day, and maybe you guys have already seen this since you deal with it, but the other day I um, sent an uh, email because I'm always perusing, trying to see what's new out there. And um, it was an article about companies that are building mass um, electric charging stations and the city that they chose uh, to go into in North America. And the photo showed this huge... Um, kind of like a big car wash thing, but where the vehicle goes underneath it and it can, I'm going to say supercharge, maybe that's not the right word, but it supercharges it and then it goes on. But those would need to be strategically placed throughout the county so that if your vehicles are South County, they're not coming all the way North County to recharge um, uh, and move mm -hmm. about. I see the opportunity for wonderful partnerships. Again, you guys may have already thought about this, but wonderful partnerships because if PSTA is moving in this direction, our county government, other city uh, governments are moving in that direction. Shared resources of larger charging stations strategically placed throughout our county would be beneficial to all of us because we're all using those massive uh, garbage trucks, whether it's for recycled material or transport of waste. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, the trolleys, the, the other county vehicles that we may use for a number of things. So yeah. um, I just see maybe a potential, as we think about it, you know, you guys have been doing this for a while, I'm just coming on board, but I see, um, a thought process, even in the consulting component, as a strategic move for a partnership that could help reduce costs for all involved. You know, Commissioner, you make a really good point, and the fact is, is that technology in that field is changing so quick, especially with electronic vehicles. Like, like you just said, charging now is down to an hour or less on some types of vehicles, and it used to take 24, 18, 24 hours. So you want to be strategic, like Barry said, going forward, but you got to also take into consideration how fast the technology is changing. So you don't want to jump too quick either. So you got to have a long-term plan and something we can grow into. And, and like what Commissioner Long said as well, one of the components of the study that Novak did for us is really going to get into just this, these 
types of issues. One of the other components of the studies, too, is going to look at our fuel sites, because that goes hand in hand. We have 17 fuel sites. Obviously, if we change the way we fuel our vehicles, you don't need 17 fuel sites. So we're looking at that whole thing strategically going forward. Yeah, I think that was my only comment I was going to add. I'm glad you touched on it. Technology is changing so fast. We talked, we just had the conversation in BTS and what we're doing there and in this arena is happening so fast that um, sometimes it's almost better to take a deep breath, close our eyes and then open it and then there'll be a new technology that we didn't spend on the previous one that has now changed so quickly. So I think incremental, um, not only thought process, but implementation process is important. Um, but just keeping an eye on that technology, because that is just going to just, I think, blow us away in the next 10 to 20 years. So, and, yeah. And so this Gary. fleet study, so Jonathan, uh, who presented to you um, the other the other day, um, on um, he, he also did the study for, for the, the fleet. And he, and he really brought in metrics and looking at not just the technology, but operationally how you'd go forward. Um, and and different alternatives to what we currently do, the way we do our business practices. I mean, you have 17 fuel sites. You're managing them. You're spending on those. There, there's no reason to have 17 fuel sites around this county. Um, we also had multiple operations. We had little one-person operations that uh, was a huge risk, you know, issue that they've consolidated. So it's ah. it's an all-encompassing study incorporating technologies, but also getting the metrics to be able to talk about the cost benefit and where the technology is and where it'll be two, three, five years in the future and bringing all that together in a report. That's the reason, you know, because we're gonna talk about consultant reports, that's the reason to be able to spend money on some of these because internally we'd never get there. You know, we would, we, we would never be able to have that type of comprehensive fresh look at where we're going with this. And so that is another report that you'll receive here shortly um, as it concludes that, uh, that information. And one more thing, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you for saying that last piece, Barry, because, and especially for Joe, if there is a desire to, re to pull down any federal dollars, this issue is one of their top three criteria mm -hmm. that governments must be able to prove when they respond to an RFP that they are focused on the newest and most innovative technologies et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll get additional federal funding in order to help us defray Commissioner Eggers some of the cost. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Gerard. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. No, no, that's okay. Um, sorry. I wanted to thank Commissioner Long. I, you know, I have a longstanding frustration with our not talking a whole lot about uh, sustainability and resiliency and that. And I think the point is that, like she said, we've been talking for three whole days and we'll talk for three more days about the budget and I can pretty much guarantee unless you run back to the office this afternoon and start revising <laughs> these things that we're not gonna hear a whole lot about resiliency and sustainability, but it is an element of our strategic plan. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we just want to see that we're thinking about these things, that we're moving on these things, and, you know, that we're going to be making some progress because we Thank have you. made a commitment to it and it needs to be reflected somewhere. Thank you. Okay. That's all. Okay. Whew. <laughs> Hello. So just, I do. Whew. We got that. We got that. We got that out. Okay, I just had to say. It. I know. Thank you for I know. Me say you, it. I, I, I would. I would. I would argue that we are mo making. Hank, we are making progress, and I do think. <coughs> I do think our groups are are, are you know considering it, and I don't think we're sticking our head in the sand. But you know, again, okay. as long as I guess we keep mentioning it, it you know. I'm not going away. Well, I didn't well. say you're going away, but you and know. I just asked. Hopefully. I know. I know we have plans to have Hank in and talk about where we're going with this, and because that's supposed to be ongoing on our agenda. And I just asked if um, um, Jill knows when, because Dell is not here, and so I, I, I don't have my calendar about when all our different work sessions are. But I know we have him on teed up to to bring all this together, so you can see what they've been working on, which I understand is the frustration because you're not seeing it in these budget presentations. Thank you. Right, but he he's one guy. Well, and 
it needs to be integrated into he, he's every he's one guy thing. he's facilitating the work that's ongoing within the departments and so it is buried within there but again i understand well, from that's your the standpoint that's buried. you're not seeing it it's it's part of their ongoing operations um you know all of our capital assets you already adopted a policy that says anytime it's a million dollars or greater we do a sea level rise um analysis and so they're looking they've incorporated that into a lot of the practices so i think there's a lot more going on than what you're seeing and we need to do a better job of articulating and showing you that yeah. so i understand the point yeah that's that's the whole point we just need to see a better representation of it right i'm sure there's lots of work going on yeah that's all and we can do that Jill. Hi. Commissioner, just wanted to remind you, you do have the report Hank presented in January, a few months ago, about mm. all of the things we have done. Um, I will, will say that our timeline with the consultant on the Sustainability Resiliency Action Plan is, is still fairly long, uh, but it is underway. It's, it's um, working well, as Barry said, across the departments. and. I'll talk with Hank if there's any way we can speed that up, but as Commissioner Gerard pointed out, he is kind of one guy, so we'll do what we can. Um, but it is a priority uh, for staff, and that's you know that's why Barry has him in our office. So we'll But it wasn't mentioned we'll in any pushing. of our presentations today. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. No, you're right, you're well. right. Um, but for example, Office of Asset Management, they work very closely with Hank. In fact, we have an energy manager that y'all approved and supported uh, in the annual budget. And so, you know, Jeremy didn't talk about it this morning, but there is a great deal that's occurring there. Uh, City Works is gonna make us better in that, in that entire area as well. Some of it's not splashy, but, yeah. but we are working. It's and splashy I, I, to me. And I think, you know, efficiencies, as you said, about the sites and how many fueling sites we have, efficiencies in the, in the automobiles that are being built now versus the ones 10, 20 years ago in terms of gas uh, efficiency. Um, I mean, I think all of that is a part of the conversation. This is not going to go uh, electric uh, overnight. And I, but as I said a minute ago, it, it is it is moving in that direction at an, on a national level. I mean, I don't think it's that anybody's putting their head in the sand, but I do think we have to be careful and we have to do it strategically. And um, so I'm, I'm, you know, again, I'm, okay, we're, we're all we're kind of all voicing a little bit of something here. So. I just say, I think we're doing it the right way. Um, maybe it needs to be brought out a little bit more what we're doing, but yeah. you know, so be it. Thank you. All right, where are we? Um, I think we're almost done. We're, we're moving to the risk fund. Um, I just, uh, one, one point you know, on that, because we kind of glossed over that with um, the third party administrator. So you know, you're gonna see a contract later that's, uh, if we determine that it's a uh, better move for us is to outsource uh, third-party administrator, uh, have a third-party administrator for worker compensation claims. Again, not a sexy area, uh, but in terms of, of having consistent applied policies and closing out cases, it's huge. Um, and so that's a piece that they're looking at that was uh, in the very beginning that we currently are going through a review process. So it could be in the, in the final budget for next year? No, it, it'll actually be a contract that'll come to you this year. Oh, okay. yeah, but okay. And we would outsource those services um, because then you know you take personality out. It's it's a yeah. it's it's a it's an insurance program. So okay, um, okay let's finish up. Thank you. Well, as we've already started discussing, our third program is the protecting county employees, citizens, and asset. Um, assets program, which is funded by the risk financing fund, which begins on page six. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, before I, you, you get interrupted all the time, and I'm probably the worst, so I apologize. Just for communication purposes, when we're finished here, we're going to stop for lunch. And mm -hmm. so, whoever, I, I don't know who's going to be here from HR or human resource. Yeah, human they were up after lunch anyway, but yeah. Oh, they were? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, sorry, go ahead. I just we're, actually, we're actually ahead. It's, uh, well, there you go. Good job. <laughs> Go ahead, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> the, fir the third and uh, final program is the Protecting County Employees, Citizens, and Assets Program, which is funded by the Risk Financing Fund. Um, overall, expenditures increased 1.6%, with the largest increase 7.9% occurring in the operating. The main driver of that increase is 
a $550,000 projected increase in insurance premiums. Insurance premiums are anticipated to continue rising over the next few years. To mitigate the increase for FY21, risk removed coverage, coverage for buildings with a value less than 500,000, reduce the excess liability limit by 5 million and reduce the excess cyber liability limit from 10 million to 5 million. Despite insurance premiums increasing by 550,000, the mitigation in FY21 avoided an, an additional cost increase of 1.2 million for FY20. For FY22, risk will not have the same opportunity to mitigate another large increase in premiums and thus has budgeted the additional $550,000 to ensure available funding. Um, and then as we somewhat briefly talked about, uh, there is a projected $400,000 expenditure for a third party administrator to manage the workers' compensation claims. The establishment of that uh, program is on track for award this August. The initiative will allow DES to better achieve uh, industry best practices, add resources during times of claim, volume increases, potentially accelerate resolution of claim files, and provide Pinellas County Sheriff access to specialized resources, and also remove conflicts of interest. The cost will initially be, will be offset by 103,000 through the elimination we talked about earlier of the one position and the two other positions, which will uh, be, um, where we'll, those full cost savings will be seen in FY23. We'll have some, some of that cost savings in FY22 once we have completely onboarded the TPA. And with that being said, I just would like to quickly conclude one, with one last thing. Um, I would like to mention that DAS is on track to complete the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, training for all, for all applicable county employees in September 2021. As a result, the department has reported a 9% reduction in county employee in injuries in FY20 when compared to FY19. And that concludes my presentation. Well, first of all, uh, Joe, thank you for um, that last bit of information, that's great, reducing the number of injuries and also keeping your FTE count, aside from the group that's leaving, but keeping your FTE count at that same level. I mean, I know it's not easy in these days and time, but thank you for that, sensitive to that as, as well. Um, did you have any other, did you have some comments you'd like to make, Joe? I just wanted to mention that even though we did um, change some of our coverages, that brings us in line with our peer agencies throughout the state. So we, we're doing nothing really that our peers are not doing. And the county's still protected, you know, across the board from that perspective. And it's been a really rough year, honestly. And, you know, my staff has really worked hard internally to make sure that, you know, the rooms were kept clean, they were sanitized from a facilities yep. perspective, from a fleet perspective. They were, you know, they were working every single day to make sure that the vehicles were up and running, that they were clean and sanitized and purchasing, of course, you know, what they had to do, you know, drop everything and buy PPE or attempt to buy PPE for the most part, but they did buy quite a bit, obviously. So it's been a really rough year, and I just wanted to mention that, that they've done a phenomenal job, and I'm really proud of the way my department has worked for the last year. Yeah, keeping our, getting the new facility too, right? The new warehouse facility to, didn't we have some warehousing of all these PPEs and where to yeah, work? Yeah, that's actually managed by the three. emergency management department. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What's that? And we had three at one point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were managing. Yeah. Um, unbelievable. Um, yeah, I mean, the stories, and we talked about it yesterday, that what our employees have done this past year, it's just unbelievable. So thanks for sharing some of that. Yeah. And I mean, just so you know, also, Joe, you know, Joe took on administrative services just, you know, what, a year and a half, two years yeah, ago, and, right. um, and really helped shore up some areas, especially around facilities, communication within facilities. We've got a lot of partners, a lot of different people, um, but also around our construction management. You know, we talked, you, you mentioned the, that's something, that's an area where we're going to spend more time in shoring up the way in which we do construction. Um, I only tell you this, not as a, you know, but you always want to have a lesson learned. You know, the sheriff building, we had the, the, the testing of the material being used by the contractor was internal to the contractor's contract. In other words, you didn't have third party testing, okay, of material. That was one of the key issues with the paint. It's little things like that, and so your construction methods that you use and the processes that you use are very, very important to have a successful outcome and into your project management. So he's headed up this area. We're looking at all that to try to make, you know, and improve uh, the way in which we do construction, so. Yeah. 
thank you, Barry, for those comments. Um, okay, thank you. Commissioner Seal. Thank you. Um, I, Joe, thank you to you and your staff. I agree it's been probably a very, very tough year, but um, you guys didn't miss a beat. And every time I was in the courthouse, it was um, very, very clean or any other county building. So always felt very safe there. So thank you to you and your staff. Um, as far as the insurance the premiums, could you send us a history over the last few years <clears throat> of what, the, um, what they've been? And when did we last bid this? It's actually competitively procured each year through our carriers. So, yeah, and, and this is, as much as it has gone up, like Patrick mentioned, it really did, we mitigated quite a bit of the actual expense by changing the way we view our policies. So, um, but we do competitively procure it every year. We don't send out a, a bid specifically, but that's handled from, you know, an insurance perspective internally for the carriers. Right, so the third, say a third party administrator goes out and procures it, correct? Right, exactly, right. Okay. Um, the other um, question I had was you mentioned going to a TPA for workers' comp that's going to cost us 400000 well, we don't know at this point in time, Commissioner, we're in the process of negotiating the contract. A good part of the expense will be offset by the reduction of positions. We don't know if it's going to offset all of it, but it should offset a good part of the expense. But as Barry mentioned, there's so much benefit, and it's really a best practice from a government perspective. Most governments specifically um, third party that service because of bench strength, because of potential conflicts of interests and other things. So it makes sense across the board to at least look at that going forward. Okay. I guess I have a little concern for that because I guess I haven't heard of that many conflictual situations. So um, <clears throat> I guess sometimes I like to still have control of different things within the county government rather than giving it to a third party. But thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Any other any other questions for Joe and company? Okay. Well, we are going to uh, break for lunch, and it's uh, I guess about five till twelve. So we'll start back around twelve thirty. All right. Thank you.
resources, and then finally we'll have uh, county administration. So Barry, go ahead and get us get us going here. All right. Well, first up uh, this afternoon is human resources, and we have with us our new, uh, fairly new, um, and new director Kimberly Crum. Um, but first, we're going to let Jim kick it off by um, outlining the budgetary piece, and then we'll hear from Kimberly. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Abernathy with the Office of Management and Budget, and I'm here to present the FY22 budget request for Human Resources and the Employee Health Benefits Fund. Uh, as Barry said with me today is uh, Kimberly Crum, the Director of HR. Uh, we'll start with, the, uh, with page one of the first attachment titled HR Budget Analysis. Human Resources provides both strategic and administrative support for the Universal personnel, Unified Personnel System. HR is structured into centers of excellence to meet the service needs of their customers. The various service centers of excellence are listed in the summary. COVID-19 had a significant impact on HR, and they adapted quickly in responding to their customers. In 2020, HR provided uninterrupted service in hiring and onboarding 424 new employees, with most of those taking place virtually. HR provided critical and up-to-date information for employees on COVID-19, including a dedicated website. HR also collaborated with the appointing authorities to form a COVID-19 cross-functional team to respond to the ever-changing circumstances. Um, so if you wanna turn to page two of the document, um, the FY22 budget request for HR includes 37 and a half FTE, the same as FY21. The general fund portion includes 35.5 FTE, while the employee health benefits portion includes two FTE. On page three of the document, you can see that the total general fund expenditures in the FY22 budget request for HR increase about $130,000, which is 3% to $4.5 million. Personal services increase about 195,000. This increase is a combination of annual salary increases along with the budget for one FTE that was inadvertently left out of the budget resulting in a higher than a higher increase in FY22 than would be expected. Operating expenditures decrease almost 38,000, about 13% to $253,350. The decrease is due mainly to the completion of the employee survey in FY21. Capital outlay decreases by almost $27,000. This is due to the, need, to the need for computer replacements in FY22 compared to FY21. For the employee, for the employee benefits uh, budget, the total employee health benefits expenditures, excluding reserves, decreased by $7.8 million, or 10.8%, to $69.9 million. Benefits claims decreased by 7.9 million to $65.3 million. This includes medical, dental, vision, mental health, the wellness incentive program, and retiree costs for Medicare Advantage. The reduction is due to lower, lower claims cost projections and the removal of a previously double budgeted of the administrative fee for the health plan. Operating expenditures increased by almost $60,000 to $4.5 million. Approximately 78.3% of the total of, the, of this cost is the administrative fee for medical claims. Total revenues decreased by $2.3 million to $75.8 million. Charges for services revenue, which, which accounts for the employer and employee contributions for benefits, increased by $112,160 uh, which is uh, about 0.1% to $75.3 million. The per employee rate for health benefits paid by the employer remains at $21,660 per year. The transfer from the general fund for OPEB obligations is not included in the FY22 budget request, which has been, which had been $2, $2 million per year. Total reserves increased by $24.6 million which is 26.5% to $117.5 million. Over the past several years, the Employee Health Benefits Fund has accumulated excess reserves 
which will reach $56.8 million in FY22. These excess reserves could be used to lower the employer's portion of the health benefits coverage. Now I'll turn it over to, uh, to the HR Director, Kimberly Crum. I take the opportunity to second Barry's welcome. Uh, I know you've been here a bit now. It's not uh -huh. like yesterday, but thank you so much uh, for weathering the last year because it's been a tough first year or, or so. So anyway, welcome to the team and good to have you here this afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Eggers and members of the commission. I'm delighted to be with you today for my first budget hearing and looking forward to sharing with you a little bit about your HR team and what we've been up to this past year and what we're looking forward to, more importantly, um, in the coming year. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Jim Abernathy and Danielle Holland from my group for helping put our, our budget together and for weathering all my questions and, and necessary support needed in the new role. And I'd also like to acknowledge the the work of our human resources team. I have been just so pleased and, and amazed by the talent that we have on the team and, and what we've been able to accomplish in the short seven months that I've been here, particularly since it's been mostly virtual. And uh, that's an interesting way to start a new job, I will say. Um, and um, looking forward to, um, to what happens in the, the coming year. Um, just to get us started, I, I think you know, in a human resources role, especially in the configuration that we have here in the county, it's such a unique uh, reporting structure. It was really important to come out of the gate, really building and maintaining and growing relationships with all of our constituents. And that included the Unified Personnel Board to whom we report, the appointing authorities um, to uh, who, who we support, and um, the Employees Advisory Committee which has been a really um, a pleasurable experience getting to know them and getting to work on initiatives that are important to them, as well as the Benefits Advisory Committee, which had just been started um, prior to the pandemic. And so any accomplishments we've had in 2020 or uh, the early part of 2021 or that we'll have going forward um, will be because of those relationships. Um, we continued to partner this last year with schools, whether it be the Pinellas County School System, with high schoolers who are in our Summer Career Acceleration Program, with the local colleges uh, who provide um, internships uh, for credit um, through a number of our departments, or through uh, PTEC, our local technical college, where we're able to begin to build a, a pipeline of folks who, whose skills may be more technical in nature and show the community that we are an incredible employer, no matter if you're a, a technical school person uh, or a college person or just a, or a high school graduate. Um, and of course, uh, Jim mentioned the, the COVID-19 cross-functional team, which was so critical, I think, to the county's success during the pandemic. It is made up of an individual from each of the appointing authorities. They're very creative and agile bunch who were able to you know, quickly make decisions as new information came out and make sure that communication was consistent across all appointing authorities. We continue to meet as a team every two weeks and we've taken on issues that are COVID related and beyond um, uh, this, uh, these past seven months. And like all UPS employees, your human resources team had to get, uh, had to, to jump to the ready uh, as the pandemic uh, made itself known. And certainly, as Jim mentioned, we had a, a number of, uh, of hires, four, over 400 hires last year, and that didn't count the 330-some hires for the supervisor of elections due to it being an elections year. We learned how to hold new hire orientation virtually and some of the technical tricks um, that keep folks engaged and make it a, a fun and enjoyable experience while allowing for questions and answers and, and information to be passed to folks. Um, our organizational talent development team found ways to provide learning opportunities, both virtually and to do so safely in person, working with our risk management team to make sure we were properly socially distanced for those groups who were working in, in our field locations. Even our benefits annual enrollment was done virtually last year. And I'd hazard a guess that it was so well received 
with our folks being so decentralized that we'll probably continue to do, in addition to our in-person uh, benefits annual enrollment, we'll likely continue to do things virtually in that space as well. We've made some updates in the way that our business partners uh, work throughout the county. They are a small but mighty bunch and they have been assigned so that every single department division within the county has a business partner um, from human resources assigned to them. They've been welcomed into, um, as part of the team in, in, in most every case, and I'm delighted that even in some areas they have office hours uh, several times a month where employees or supervisors can meet with them to go over issues or ask questions and get responses right away. To the extent that issues go beyond a business partner um, capability and they require a specialty area within HR, they know exactly where to refer folks so that they can get what they need. Um, Jim mentioned the COVID webpage, which has been incredibly popular. Um, just the webpage alone has over 55,000 hits. And when you include the frequently asked questions pages and some of the supervisor links, those uh, have had over 100,000 views. So when you're looking at a group of employees that's just over 3,000, to have 100,000 hits, we're, we're really making use of that uh, COVID, COVID webpage. Looking forward, there were just three things that I wanted to highlight for you that I think would be of, of uh, interest. Um, the Benefits Advisory Committee, which was relatively new um, upon arrival, um, has been such a delightful experience to get to know them. What a capable um, group of uh, folks that have been selected to help really look over the county's full benefit complement to make sure that if we want to be, or as an employer of choice or the top tier employer, the place that everyone wants to work, we want to make sure that we have benefits that appeal to every demographic. So no matter what stage of life you're in, we have something for everyone. Um, the committee, as it was just getting started, was showing some signs of wear and, and getting traction and really deep diving, especially virtually. And so we made the agreement that we would divide up into five subcommittees. And uh, members of the BAC were invited to attend as many subcommittees as they liked. There are voluntary benefits, time off or leave time, education assistance, wellness and incentives, and plan design. And so those subcommittees have begun to meet. Most have met at least a couple of times. And in fact, the Voluntary Benefits uh, Committee has already made a recommendation through the full BAC and to the appointing authorities to add some insurance, ancillary insurance products to our benefits mix this coming fall. So we're working toward that. Um, upcoming, we're scheduled to review benchmarking data from some of our um, most com comparable Florida entities here in the coming month and looking forward to all that the Benefits Advisory Committee will be able to add uh, to our employee benefits package. Next, I wanted to, to just mention the Oracle EBS upgrade. Oracle EBS is your system of record for human resources information on our employees and it hasn't been upgraded in a decade. And so we've fallen a little bit behind in our ability to provide analytics to the appointing authorities that we support. And it's, it's been interesting uh, working with, uh, with Barry and the other appointing authorities to, um, to, to really kickstart this uh, initiative through BTS and with our other partners who use that system, purchasing and payroll, to really have a combined and unified effort to upgrade the system and to, to have better data analytics. Um, we're looking at the first estimated go live of the very base system will be in July, and then uh, the 330 pain points that we've identified will begin to, to, to check those off the list uh, with uh, hopefully ongoing uh, implementations. From an HR perspective, this upgrade can revolutionize our ability to analyze and provide data to the folks that we support. And so we really are looking for a hire to retire solution where everything is kept in one place so that if you're an employee who is on a career path to promotion and you need certain 
um, courses or certain activities in order to be promoted, you can see in your uh, record exactly what's needed. And as importantly, your supervisor can coach you to ensure that you receive those, um, those uh, activities and trainings and qualify for your, your promotion. It also allows for exception reporting. So that as an example, if we input certifications, because as we know, many of our employees today, their jobs require certifications for us to be in compliance. And so if we place that into the system, we can receive notifications when someone's certification is about to expire. And we can ensure that we remain compliant in that way. So it's very exciting. And we're looking forward. To, it's going to be a, a heavy lift um, for certain. But we're looking forward to carrying that project across the finish line and to the data and the analytics that it'll provide. And then finally, I just wanted to mention that this is an odd number year where we'll be doing the employee voice uh, survey again. This will be the fifth employee voice survey that Pinellas County has done, I understand. And I really commend you for the, the effort that it takes to receive that information and to actually act upon those items of, uh, of interest or need. And so that will be kicking off. You'll start to see information about it in June. Uh, the survey will actually take place sometime in August, and then results are typically available around October. So those um, conclude my prepared remarks, and I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to, to chat with you for a minute about the human resources budget, and thank everyone for their, their warm welcome. Well, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Barry, did you have any something? Yeah, just a couple of follow-ups. Well, one, the employee voice survey is very important. We we learn a lot about it. It just summarizes information. You can see when maybe a particular department should improve communication, or maybe there's issues that we need to dive deeper into. So very, very important. It'll be kind of interesting this year, considering <laughs> the year we've been through, what comes out of that. But um, I wanted to mention a couple of things that was mentioned, but I didn't want to gloss over it. First, we didn't put two, uh, an additional $2 million into the OPEB. The OPEB, you know, in my opinion, you know, Bill, Bill and I have had this conversation since I arrived, is uh, it's, um, you know, it was um, uh, a CPA's dream uh, to, to create this fund. And, and really what it's covering is, you, we, we, by law, we have to charge employees the, uh, a standard cost for health insurance after they retire. Well, it's really the difference because they're not paying the full premium rate had they been on their own plan. It, it's really a false savings account, I mean, because it's set up by statute. We've got a lot of money in that account. We would never meet, if we tried for a million years, the, the actuarial number. You don't have to save for that. So I just wanted a kind of full disclosure of that. We're, we're, we're not putting additional money into that as part of the budget recommendation as it stands right now. Okay. Go ahead. So how much money is in there now? Bill? Uh, in total, there's um, the, there's $45 million in OPEB-related uh, contributions. Uh, $26 million of that is directly from the, the general fund. That uh, we had we had $2 million budgeted for FY21. Um, that at this point we're not including that as a as a transfer, and then we did not include anything in the budget for 22. Oh, a follow-up, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm not an actuary by any stretch, but are we going to continue to leave it at that amount, given that's well, actuarially a lot more money than we need to have in there, isn't it? I, I, I'd rather come back to you with a strategy on that, because, again, from my perspective, it is a, um, it's free and available money. Okay? I don't think you need to save for that. Um, you know, in actual cash value, the way we've done that, but that's a pretty strategic issue. So I'd, I'd like to think about, you know, how we how we do that, or what we do with that money. But you're right, we could use that for another purpose. Well, um, there's no re there's comment. no requirement. I'll save my comments for our next debriefing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I, I but I want to bring Kim Burke into that com conversation also. Yeah. You know, I, I I really do. I mean, I think in fairness, we. We, we did that for a reason. I have a different viewpoint on that, and I want to make sure we think through that before we significantly change uh, that, that policy direction, in fairness. Because um, I think from a CPA standpoint, he, probably, he may have a different view on that. I'm sure he does. <laughs> um, but, so. just, but just re refresh my, or what you may have said it, but 
that money comes from all of us as employees, right? No, 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 no. This is what we put in as a, as a, as a reserve to cover our liability. Only portion of that's general fund because we have a lot of special funds. So for instance, utilities, they pay into that. Well, if for some reason we said, let's no longer have that, the utilities piece would go back to them. Okay. Um, then the second piece that I wanted to you know, alert you to is the um, excess health um, reserves. It is good to have a health reserve because you can have significant swings you know, in your health care costs. We've seen that over the years. However, we're at a point where we have very, very healthy <laughs> um, reserves in, in that. And so that may be an area where we, um, we choose to underfund. That's part of, I'm just alerting you to, part of the things we're looking at in terms of this year's budget. We may choose to underfund the amount that we put into that because we don't want that to reserve to grow um, you know, too much. And so uh, that's another area that we're looking at. Okay. Anybody else have any questions on, on those comments? Um, any other questions for Kimberly? Uh, I had a couple, if you uh, don't mind. The $21,660 per employee for health care benefits, is that all of our benefits? Is that a number that I saw, Jim? No, that is uh, the just, health, that's, that's the just, health portion only. That's okay. d contributed by the, by the county, by the employers. Uh, right. There are other uh, benefits like life insurance, dental, Vision, those things are, it's a much smaller amount, um, right. but it's the $21,660 that is for the health benefits. And so what's that trend look like, say, for the last three years? We've kept it this, um, if we keep it flat in FY22, that'd be the third year in a row that we kept it at the $21,660 per FTE um, cost. Okay, all right. And then you had... Um, Performance performance indicators in here, which I thought were interesting. Tell me about the the, the seventy percent year one retention um, number. Is that that not only was an actual in twenty nineteen, but it continues to be a goal. Just from a non professional, it seems low. Seventy percent seems low, but maybe it's high. I don't really know. Tell me about that 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 number a little bit. We could certainly benchmark that, and I, I don't have benchmarking information to okay. share with you today, but that would be an interesting um, uh, piece of data to look into. That basically says that of your, your folks that are hired each year, 70% um, of them uh, are retained. So about a 30% turnover in your first year yeah. hires. Uh, yeah, it would be interesting to know if that's good, bad, or right on target. I have, I have no idea. Um, and then, and then you um, hiring challenges. I mean, we, we hear that throughout our business community, and we hear it from different sources that we're having a hard time. Not we hear, but I was asking the question: uh, hiring, getting enough people to uh, to apply for jobs. Um, I noticed that you had a career expo where 22 were hired. Mm -hmm. um, that's I think that sounds really good. Um, just talk a little bit about the, the hiring challenges, or maybe we don't have any of those. I know that we, in the Board of County Commissioner's Office, just went through a search process, and we had 70? 94. 94 applied for one spot. So mm -hmm. um, it seems like there's an abundance of people to apply, but we've heard the opposite. So just maybe a comment on that. You know, I think it depends on the type of position Absolutely. for which you're recruiting. And, hmm. and while we have, I, I won't think, I don't believe that we've had incredible difficulty in hiring for most positions. Some of the creative recruitment initiatives that you're seeing in our annual report, and thank you for highlighting that, um, working with the high school, working with the trade schools, working with colleges to ensure that we've got a path <clears throat> for um, candidates to find us outside the norms. We're doing quite a bit with social media recruitment. If you're on LinkedIn, you'll see us quite a bit. Um, our managers are becoming more and more comfortable, I believe, with using LinkedIn and other social media as a source for, for, for recruitment as well. And so all of those initiatives work together to make sure that when you put an opportunity out, you get a, an abundance of candidates that you can choose from. Okay. And then I just had one final question. Um, 
it looks like in the numbers we have 50 percent of our workforce is 50 and over at least in the stats that I was looking at um, and how how does that benchmark and what does that say for opportunities for the younger generations looking for career paths in government uh, well, if, if you can make any general comments about that you know in general government's a great place to work and the I think we we should be working together to get the word out and make sure that our community recognizes us for the diverse employer that we are because I think a, a number of, of folks in the public see us you know based on the interactions they have with our offices if I need my driver's license you know renewed I have one experience if I need a permit I I have another um, but the, I'm not sure that the public really realizes all that county employment, all that we have to offer. And so some of our initiatives, like the Career Expo that happened before the pandemic, if I recall correctly, over 500 people attended, and we were able to hire 22 people before year end out of that group. That's a sizable initiative. It took quite a bit of effort, but we partnered with uh, various groups that had a need that the Career Expo could fill. And by partnering together, we were able to, uh, to hire 22 people. And we've had other such initiatives, some virtual uh, as well. And so using all of the tools that are available to us, that's what it's gonna take, I think, to get the word out and to make sure we've got a constant stream of available talent that fits the needs for all of our departments. Okay, great, that's a good answer, thank you. Any, any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for asking that question about retention um, for employment, because we hear all the time that there are positions available, persons are looking for employment opportunities, and sometimes they just don't match up. And then sometimes persons have to um, provide work searches, so they're applying for jobs that they actually are not qualified for. So when you start kind of going through those applications, you weed out which ones are just applying for a job versus which ones are actually qualified. The retention rate, <coughs> desired retention rate is around 90%, but it's just very difficult to do that because we are now such a mobile society um, when it comes to employment. Um, I guess my question would be, um, we certainly want to uh, continue to develop internal talent. So um, do we also have a, a strong committed um, program for those that are working currently to follow an internal path that may lead to um, team lead, you know, manager, director, you know, or what have you, because sometimes that also will determine whether or not people remain with us if if they don't see a path where they can excel within the organization. So, Commissioner, you're you're so right. It's incumbent upon us as a, a human resources team and then extending through all the appointing authorities to make sure that there's a path for development. I've been incredibly impressed by the um, unified, um, uh, the organizational talent developments, um, has a SharePoint website that has a wide variety of training opportunities for our employees and they take advantage of them um, in, in great number. Um, in addition to that, in some appointing authorities, there are positions that have career paths available. And Barry, I don't want to talk about your career paths, <laughs> but there's been tremendous effort this past year in the BCC and in other appointing authorities as well to create career paths so that employees have a path to be able to receive promotions and accolades. Um, and, and be prepared for the next level. And as, as folks are retiring from the county because of our age demographics, mm -hmm. it makes sure that we have people prepped and ready um, to, to not just be minimally qualified, but to be able to hit the cover off the ball, uh, so to speak, in, um, in the next, their next role. And I think you're, you're starting to do that. I, I pay attention to the training opportunities that are presented. Yeah, I look at them. <laughs> Um, I pay attention to those training opportunities, and a lot of those areas are really focused. Um, and anything that you're doing um, that is equity-based, I think, um, mixed in with a number of the other genres that you have there, whether it's strategy, whether it's teamwork or team building, um, I, I really like what I see 
um, from the department there. So. Commissioner, to add to that, so Central HR has opportunities. Different departments have different levels of implementation in that to where they have good succession plans. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the one that does it really well in Megan. Um, you know, out of utilities, they've knocked it out of the park. They have, they have, they have. You know, high, you know, high school career uh, paths. They've got all kinds of different things, and they're working on succession planning. There are others where we ha we have it available and we've done it, but just not. We don't have a formalized succession plan. As part of this year, as as, as we go through evaluation of the departments, that's going to be a key component that we start checking off. That, that they have those programs in place. But it really has to be individualized to the department. They can provide the resources, and, and but we've got, to, we've got to get people to engage on that and really take that seriously. And asset mapping within that genre will really help you as well see, you know, what you have, where it is that maybe you're trying to go, what you see as it relates to our strategic plan long term, and then what we can develop versus what we may be looking for on the outside. So. I'll be sure to take your comments, Commissioner Flowers, back to the team. And also, I need to acknowledge, we have over 80 learning partners that are employees in various department divisions across all appointing authorities that meet together to talk about what's needed, what's necessary, where do we get critical mass so that we'll have plenty excuse me, of attendees and we can be efficient and effective in our, in our uh, learning opportunities. And so it's really hats off to these partnerships that I mentioned at the outset. Without them, you know, we're, we're, we're doing our best, you know, with just our minds engaged. But once we have 80 learning partners across 10 appointing authorities, we can really get some horsepower. I just had one final question. Um, as to one of the things that, um, this past year has brought out, obviously, is a lot of um, compliments and challenges and, and criticisms, if you will, on our ability or inability to focus on wellness. Um, uh, not, I'm not really talking about to our employees, but really to our general population. You know, maybe spinning the the idea that we uh, can provide more uh, uh, hints. Uh, programs that uh, that give folks an idea how we can do a better job of of transmitting nutritional concepts and exercise concepts and mental wellness concepts and all of those that make up the wellness package. So I guess two questions. One, it uh, seems like we're doing a pretty good job internally to encourage that preventative side. Um, any thoughts as to how we can take what we do um, and maybe reach out to our public in a way. I don't know if it's a combination of HR and our Department of Health, or and I know that there are efforts that are, are that are made out there, but it just doesn't seem like they're um, perhaps coordinated or communicated enough. Just your thoughts on 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 wellness. You know, it's certainly interesting um, that. I don't think I've had that discussion in my seven months here, but I'd be very open to having it with how we could work with the human services groups or the health department to leverage some of what we've seen successes in mm -hmm. uh, with our employees. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. very well, intriguing. Yeah, yeah, I think obviously our focus is for our employees. That's what HR is all about. But it just seems there's, at least we've been challenged that there's a missing element out there of, of, of the messaging about wellness and the overall issues that we can address and maybe a way to get our residents thinking or, or, or changing their thought process. And not that it's government's job to do that, but I don't think it helps. It hurts to be a, a partner in that those efforts. So, okay. Anything else uh, from anybody? Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. And all right, Rod, come on up. All right, Jim. Oh, no, this is Bill. <laughs> Jim looked at me like, uh oh, <laughs> what am I going to say? We, there's a, it, Jim really, really, really digs into the detail regarding our health benefits and things like that. And, and that's an area where we, we spent some time this year. Um, we, we're, there's a lot more we can do. You know, we challenged the, um, the Benefits Advisory Committee, um, but there's a lot more we can do. There's, I think there's, there's some opportunities to go into uh, healthy lifestyles and things like that. There's a lot more we can do with um, a, um, 
a different type of programming to where we give you some money and, and you can save for that and then use it in retirement and things like that for you to make good, good or better choices. Our program really isn't set up for that. So I, I do think there's some opportunities there and that we spend a lot of money on benefits. So yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. All right, go ahead, Bill. Well, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, we're in the home stretch here and I'm gonna help to try to make sure we get across the finish line relatively quickly. Um, this is uh, to discuss the county administration budget and uh, Barry asked Rodney to come up because workforce development under Barry is part of that budget. Um, I do wanna start with just a quick overview of what county administration is all about. More for the viewing audience than for you all because obviously you work with Barry every day. You're well aware of what Barry does and what the team under him does. Um, so that being said, uh, the county administrator is the chief administrative officer for the county. Uh, he's primarily responsible for implementing the policy directives of the board. Uh, some of the major things that have uh, been happening over the past year um, is strengthening of a network of partnerships across the region as well as within the county. Um, I know Barry made reference to an award that's gonna be uh, provided uh, by a statewide organization uh, next week that he'll announce. Um, and that's gonna be something that helps to highlight uh, what he's been able to do and accomplish uh, through that work. Uh, there was talk earlier today about the res sustainability and resiliency program. Um, Hank is part of Barry's staff and when the comment was made that nobody's talked about that, that was actually part of this write-up. Um, so since we've already talked about it, I'm not gonna cover it more, <laughs> but uh, that is a major focal point for Barry and uh, from a policy perspective and then also from an operational perspective within all of the departments. I mentioned workforce development. Uh, Rodney and uh, two folks that he has working with him are focused on that every day, work very, very closely with Kimberly and her team. Uh, to make sure that we can develop career paths and ladders, evaluate market competitiveness, uh, developing a succession planning program, and making sure that the employee performance evaluation system can be improved as well, uh, because that's foundational for us to be able to help support our employers and the our employees in their growth and development. Uh, three positions, which I know you're all familiar and passionate about, are the assistant to the county administrator positions that are serving the unincorporated areas directly and serving as liaisons with the community organizations that are helping to make sure that those unincorporated communities have a voice with the commission and with the departments here within the county. Um, the liaisons did recently launch a web portal that I believe you're familiar with and you just voted or will be voting on Tuesday about some of the first applications that have come through for funding from your MSTU uh, funding uh, special projects that you have, uh, that you've been doing every year for many years now, it's $220,000 a year, that is dedicated to help serve special projects in the unincorporated communities. That web portal is the new way to be able to navigate all the community organizations into having opportunities to access that fund. Uh, the other thing that's gonna be a major initiative moving forward into FY22 is revisiting the countywide strategic plan, and there'll be a lot more to come on that. Uh, moving forward to the budget, uh, we'll, and now I'm on page two of the analysis. Uh, at the top, you'll see that the staffing levels are unchanged between this year and what's proposed for next year. Uh, however, that being said, I do wanna highlight one major change um, in terms of service levels that you're gonna experience and that's that Nancy McKibben, as you've talked about earlier, is gonna be dedicated fully to being able to provide service to the unincorporated communities in the north part of the county. She's currently splitting, or had been splitting time between her previous role in public works, along with that role as an unincorporated liaison, but because of the additional needs and desire to make sure that she can be fully serving that community as well as possible, she's gonna be fully dedicated to that. Uh, Chris Moore is already pretty well dedicated fully already because of his role as the CRA coordinator in Lelman. And Brian is still splitting time between being an intergovernmental liaison and helping with the lobbying activities and coordination. But he's also doing the unincorporated liaison role for the rest of the county as well. Uh, so those are those three roles and want to make sure I highlighted Nancy's change there uh, because that's something we've talked about before and that's so important to making sure that we serve our residents. Um, as far as the budget itself and the numbers, um, it's almost all personal services. As you'll see 90% of the total county admin budget of $3.5 million proposed for FY22 is personal services, those 20 FTEs that you see. 
Um, the changes that you see there, there's about an 11% increase in personal services. Uh, that's primarily a result of Nancy being fully dedicated to that program as opposed to being funded out of public works. Um, and then the other change is adding a second ICMA fellow. Uh, currently we have one who is starting, uh, I believe his name is Christopher Spahn, am I correct on that? Um, he's starting on June 1st, we'll all become more familiar with him in about two weeks. Um, and we are hoping to be able to bring on another ICMA fellow as a growth and development opportunity and to help cultivate new talent in our organization moving forward. So that's the other piece of the change that you see there. And so uh, those for not familiar, ICMA is International City and County Managers Association. They have a competitive fellowship program um, where they bring in the best and the brightest people apply to that. They screen them down. They put them out for us to then interview and select. Um, we want to we want to support that program. We, we tried to do it last year the middle of the pandemic. It just didn't work out. Um, and so the, but we're going to bring one on this year. We want to make sure we have two next year. Just so you know, even to receive a, um, a fellow, you have to have a work plan that's accepted through ICMA. So it's a formalized program. So we bring them in, we let them work in general administration, and then we send them out and they rotate around through departments. And so they get some experience out in those areas, but you give them it also adds fresh set of eyes out in departments. I've used this before and it's amazing you bring somebody in and they look at it and the department, you know, they're all engineers for instance, I'll just pick on engineers, you know, I'm looking at Dave. And uh, you know, and, and then all of a sudden they see an administrative piece that they didn't think of. It's new, it's fresh, it's talent, but it also gives you a pipeline and um, some, some young experience. And so anyway, it's a, it's a great program. I'm, I'm really looking forward to developing that. And that's, that's the addition that we added this next year. And then the last thing I want to uh, make mention of is if you look at the operating expenses, you'll see there's a significant decrease there. And that's primarily related to the uh, study that was mentioned earlier that Hank is leading and just the pace of that study. Uh, most of the expense will be this year. The remainder of the expense will be as they finalize that study next year and as a result of that non-recurring change, that's the primary basis of that change in $60,000 of a decrease in the operating expenses for FY22. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Barry for any additional remarks he wants to make about the initiatives. The only additional remarks, I mean, I, I think I keep you pretty informed um, in terms of the ongoing activities. I did ask Rod to come up because I really want Rodney to talk about um, our employee relation issues. You know, everybody remembers Evergreen, the, the Evergreen study, you know, and we're trying to come out of that because we had to really look and make sure people were in the right job classifications. We had to create career ladders. Um, and, and then work with our employees. Well, it's been a challenge to do that. We got a lot of departments and they're inter, intertwined with uh, constitutional officers and things like that. So I, I just wanted him to speak to some of those efforts um, because we've made progress, but we, we have a, a ways to go still also. And departments did make a lot of progress with regard to providing learning opportunities for their departments within the department, uh, creating um, certifications, creating uh, mentoring programs, uh, and also other vendor training in an effort to uh, improve the skills of employees. So the career paths are designed to um, incentivize employees to perform a wider variety of work. It's not a promotion but it's just a, a, uh, an employee can perform a wider variety of work within the scope of their job description. Uh, and in doing that, uh, they prepare themselves for promotional opportunities. I continue to be impressed by the ambitiousness of the employees that work for you. They are hungry, they want more. And I think these programs will help to get them that more and give them a, a, a upward mobility opportunities that they didn't have in the past. As most of you know, with compensation, anytime you make an adjustment, you cure 10 problems and you create five more. So we're, I think we're down to that five more. Uh, we may have another, another round to go before we really resolve the majority of the problems. But I think between the career paths, and we did do an equity adjustment, where there were some employees that were, as a result of uh, many years of no increases, uh, they were behind employees that started after the increases started to uh, take effect. So uh, we were bringing employees in 
with no ex uh, county seniority uh, um, uh, at market, but because employees had been here for six or seven years and did not have an increase, they were below the market. So we brought those employees up to a point where they had some internal equity. And there weren't as many as I thought that there was. I think there was maybe about 125 employees that were affected by that. But we were able to make that adjustment. So I think we're pretty clean so far as internal equity is concerned. With that, I'll open it up to any questions. Any questions for Barry? Any, any comments? Um, I just had a couple. I just um, Commissioner Peters. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Peters. I apologize. Didn't see you. So I, I have a few. Um, so, um, like sustainability, you know, I can see how that's interwoven, but I don't see health and human services interwoven like sustainability is, and that should have a significant budget, and we didn't hear from them. And I would really like to have an update. Human on, services. Yeah, health, well, health and human services. Yeah, they're coming up in the next round. So in okay. June, in June we have three more days. Okay. And so they'll be at that time. Okay, great. Because I, I really was missing them when it happened <laughs> to them. So yeah. thank you. You're not done yet. We've uh, got <laughs> three more days. Um, I, what I will tell you is I truly appreciate the performance dashboards. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really great. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate everybody's passion when they come up and talk about their departments. It's wonderful, and I've learned a lot, so I really appreciate that. Um, I do have a couple, just one thought, and it came up, um, Commissioner Flowers led to it, and, and I do, and I kind of should have brought it up in the last one, but Barry, I think this falls on you, um, and that is I like to see more internal growth among mm -hmm. our employees because um, since you've been here, we've done a great deal of hiring people not only from other counties but from other states. Um, and so I just wanted to reiterate under your budget that kind of statement um, because I, I know we're working on it and I know you're doing a great job, um, Rodney, and I'm, I'm really thrilled with what the work you've done. I think it's really going to take us a long way, but I just wanted to reiterate it again at, at this time. Um, and that's really you know all I have other than since there's more budget meetings, I'll, I'll reserve my thoughts on what I think the budget should be and where we should be going with it until then. But. Um, but to your point, Commissioner, I 100% agree with that. We should never have to go outside for talent. Okay, we we may have to, because you got you have to have the skill sets. Okay. But our goal should be that we 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 are ready to be able to promote people from within. There's no question. Yeah, and so um, I mean, you know, my other thoughts. I'm hearing every department is kind of saying a three percent, a three percent. I kind of understand a three percent. You know, I get that. Um, I'm just hoping that when, when you present that overall budget, you're not looking at, um, you know, I have a lot of questions for you, and I can save it for our one-on-one -on -one about how we collected money last year that didn't pay for any bills, and it just went for reserves. And, and uh, you have told me that our reserves are incredibly healthy, and I, I'm hoping that that's an accurate statement, that our reserves are incredibly healthy. They are. So I'm just hoping that on this next budget coming up, that we aren't going to be focusing on reserves. If our reserves are so incredibly healthy, I would love to see our, our taxpayers get a real break and maybe focus on our 3% yep. and not focus on more reserves, at least for one year. Oh, I 100% agree. So okay. as part of, but that won't be for the June, that'll be for the July 13th when I actually roll out a budget, yes, uh, my um, budget recommendation. Yes, unfortunately, I will not be here on July 13th, so you're going to have to listen to me before then. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to hear what I have to say before then. Okay, but but that's where, I'm, where we're going to look at that. We're going to look at our reserves, and we've tried, I tried to highlight those. These are Bill's little things that he, you know, he, he held that, that the yeah. OPEB, and these. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to put all these on the table and talk about a sustainable budget. Um, and I think those are all fair game, including, you know, how much we have in the health uh, fund and how much we have in OPEB. And let's talk through those. And, and I appreciate where the departments have come up and said we're not, our fund is not where it needs to be or our fund is healthy. Mm -hmm. I think this year that has been very helpful for us to help understand that. So I do like this process this year. I think it's been good. I think the information provided has been really good. The performance measures have been really good. Um, it's nice to know that we have a healthy reserves in one department um, that we, you know, we may have to take some. I, I love that we're hearing about that. So thank you. I think uh, I think I like this year good uh, very well. And um, unfortunately, I won't be here on the 13th. So you will be hearing me talk <laughs> a lot about how I, I'm, well, I'm really expecting a real good break for our taxpayers this round. We'll, we'll talk through that either right before you leave or after, right after you get back. But um, um, yeah. and just to that point, I think that was really the the 
the, the efforts last year when we were talking about a one-year budget, like we always do, a one-year operating budget, we really looked at it in two years. Correct. Um, and the idea was is that we would build reserves last year in anticipation of economic, we didn't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the idea was that if it didn't, if it didn't materialize, that we would have excess reserves that we would be able to then look at the millage rate to kind of compensate that down a little bit. And so there have been some capital additions that have gone to our reserves mm -hmm. that you've talked about, the sheriffs, uh, the body cams for one, and some other things. But I, you know, obviously that's a, a statement that we'll get to in July uh, in, a, in a little more detail. You will, uh, and but remember, you, you we still have um, a lot more departments coming up, and you'll see some of the requests and some that don't report to me that have healthy requests. So yeah, um, we have to we have to include all that into that factor when into we that when mix. we it's yeah. one big checkbook, and there's only yeah. so many checks to write. So yeah. we got to make some of those decisions. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> Go ahead. No, 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 please. To. No, go, go. I'm supposed to go I last. I thought you go. were done. No, I had a couple more, but go ahead, please. And I'll, well, I'll go ahead. I'll write it down so I don't forget. Okay. Uh, these are these, these should, should be um, quick. Uh, the one question that I, I, I had asked Kimberly uh, Rodney about employment opportunities here and um, how we're doing from a, uh, you know, I guess it really depends on the job. Salaries, benefits, um, and the opportunities that we have. Diverse, I think that was a great point that Kimberly brought up, is that diverse amount, the type of opportunities that we have here at the county. What are you seeing from a from that employment standpoint out there in terms of available talent? Um, and how are we doing from a salary benefit perspective? You know, and that's always a continuing struggle. And I think HR and, 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 and some of the employee groups, they're, they're working on uh, provide, providing some flexibility with regard to the uh, health insurance package. So it's more customized. A 60-year-old needs uh, a suite of benefits different than a 20-year-old. And this uh, benefits advisory group is really working on trying to put a package together like that so it'll help us with our recruiting. Um, I, in addition to that, you know, market competitiveness continues to be a struggle. It will always be a struggle. But I think we know where we are. And we know where our gaps are, and, and we try to meet them as best as we can, trying to communicate effectively that <laughs> benefits cost money. And it, that does affect your net salary. And it, a lot of it is just communicating effectively to our applicants that, you know, because you pay less for health insurance means you might not get as much in cash compensation, but your net value is, is the same. Uh, we do have some challenges with some positions, especially in skilled trades at this point in time, with market competitiveness. We did a, uh, a mini benchmark survey and realized that we had some positions that, you know, they were about 10 percent below the market. We did make some adjustments in order to, uh, to address that. But we will continue to do market surveys. I think we're in pretty good shape, but, you know, we always have that uh, issue with competing with the uh, private sector, especially for engineers, uh, IT professionals, it's very difficult to recruit the, because of the flexibility they have with regard to their employment environment, but also the cash compensation. And then just two final, uh, just really not comments, but just things I wanted to ask you about. Really, um, again, uh, kudos to the assistant to the county administrator positions and the flexibility that you're already showing on how those three folks develop differently. I mean, they're developing, the positions are developing differently mm -hmm. um, as, as we go forward. I think it's just, it's a testament to the idea that it was a pilot at the beginning. You know, let's see how it goes. It's gone well, and then we continue to tweak that, but I appreciate that. Um, the, the, MSTU, uh, the MSTU projects that you, we talked about, those mm -hmm. portals, it seems almost that we have enough reserves that we probably don't even need to fund it this year. Uh, coming up, but I'd, maybe we'll have further conversations about that as an opportunity is of using some reserves there. Um, we're not we're not we're not spending yeah. it down each year, so that that, that might that's be. true. Yeah, yeah. So um, we can look at that. And then so te and then technically you're adding a half an FTE to your group this year. Yeah, it's it's actually what it is. It's actually increasing an FTE over at Public Works because um, we actually had Nancy under ours even though she wasn't really working oh. on a whole lot of public okay. work. So we're going to let Kelly backfill the position I kind of stole from her. Um, okay. So you've had you've had her on you full. I've had it on okay. our table of organization okay. because I wanted her to have the direct line to me. But 
she um, um, actually was um, out at, it was a position that was out on public works okay. that we moved over. All right. Commissioner Seal, um, I think you had your hand up. Sorry about that. And you. After that. Thank you very much. Um, so um, it's really, again, you know, historical perspective. It's really interesting to see um, the budgets as compared to fiscal year 18 and 19. And um, I'm glad we are in a healthy situation, but I always err on the side of caution. I remember when I first joined the county that our level of reserves were fairly low, probably around two to three percent. And during the good real estate years, we made a policy decision to, we augmented different departments, but we also put a, quite a bit of money away in reserves, mm -hmm. which during the Great Recession really helped us. And so um, to that end, I think it would be interesting to have one list of the reserves and which ones you think are too much, too little. Um, so one sheet, and then I'd also like a list of all the consultants, because yes. there's a couple more consultants I noticed that I wasn't aware of. So um, maybe one sheet that shows all of that. And Commissioner, and, on, uh, on that, where, because Bill and I were talking about that, we want to have that ready for general operating, which would give us a little time to collect the information you're looking for. But we use consultants like Megan uses consultants out in utilities. I, I didn't think you're looking for those, but I, so I wanted to know where where to draw the line in terms of consolidating down that list. I just want to be responsive to your request. It's more where you are trying to bring in um, like Santec or Kyer okay. or. Um, I noticed the one so the general government type um, activities where you're trying to change our way we do business, okay. I guess is the best. The, like um, DAS hired Imagine that consulting for facilities and real property. Mm -hmm. So what did they what they accomplish, you know, I. Yep. No, I, 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 just I just wanted to clarify that. So we will we'll prepare that um, and we'll have that ready for our June meetings. Okay. And then um, I noticed on the dashboard, of course, the workforce relations, some of them are back to 2019. So this new voice survey will, that's going to be performed in August should provide us some update on um, employee satisfaction with compensation and the overall level of confidence in the leadership of executive leadership. Mm -hmm. um, the only final question comment I have is we have on hold to develop a succession plan. And again, I'll go back in history. I've been asking for a succession plan since the first day I arrived in 1999. We don't have a succession plan and we really now that you have the staffing across the departments and reorganize things, it's time to put that into play. We agree with that. Rodney has a comment on that because I, I I don't know where you're, are you, you're pulling that off the dashboard? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Rodney. It doesn't hold. So that's one of the programs that, uh, you know, we will be working on this year. I got a little delayed because of what we're trying to do with the, uh, the Oracle system. Uh, the, the nine buck succession plans work really, really well when they're automated. Uh, it, it's easier for them to be populated and maintained. Everybody's excited about creating the one, but maintaining it is difficult. So we're going to develop a tool or have a tool in order to, to maintain a nine box succession plan. But we hope to um, have that done by 2022 because I want to get a performance evaluation system in place also. So we're going to do that concurrently, but we're working on that this year. But to your point, Commissioner, <laughs> It, I think you'd be really surprised of the lack of automation we have over in our HR area. Um, we really haven't turned on the HR functions of Oracle to the extent they need. Rodney wanted to blow up the whole system and put in a whole new system. Um, and <laughs> so we, we went through we went through months of uh, <laughs> he <laughs> well, 
I, I mean, because because of the need, uh, just the evaluation system. When we're talking, we're talking. You know, if you talk to our employees, one of the things you see in the in the um, em employee voice service is going to a pay performance. Okay. Well, you can't do a pay performance system if you don't have an evaluation system in place. Well, we don't have a good, strong evaluation system, and the Oracle system is not a good evaluation system. So there's some there's some things we have to pull together there, but. The, the concept of succession plan is not on hold. People are gonna be doing that. He's talking about the automated piece, but the need for them to do that is gonna be incorporated within um, everybody's job right now, and, and, and they should be working on those. I mean, you made a, okay. you made, you've made a comment about the utilities um, in Megan's group that has, has actually gone through that. They, that. they are, and we have different levels. I'll be very blunt. We, we have different people that are doing different you know, levels of quality with that. Um, but everybody should be. That's a leadership priority. Um, and, you know, and, and I, I only I only prop up Megan because I think she's probably got it from, you know, she's got the uh, the, the programs in place to, to have career press and bring people in all the way through, you know, management. And, and so she's a little further along than I think others are. Um, but we, we need to pull that all together, you know, and. And, and but the automation piece is the way we'll actually be able to track that. Anything else, Commissioner Seal? Um, just that I really want to say thank you for the miraculous job that everybody did during 2020 um, to now. Um, I feel like I am coming across as the angry curmudgeon. Um, <laughs> but I guess I'm just concerned because I know that we are very fortunate to be receiving CARES funding and all other kinds of funding. And I just I just remember the very, very painful times for the employees as well as for the commission, as well as administration during the Great Recession. And you know, we just never know if that could happen to us again in the future. So yeah. I just always um, want to just be cautious and careful. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good point. That's uh, one of the reasons I kind of highlighted those departments that are keeping their FTEs in check because we just want to be careful, especially during this uncertain time, how we grow our grow our groups. Commissioner Long, you had a, a question or comment. I did, and I so appreciate um, Commissioner Seals' comments because I know sometimes I come across that way. I don't know if it's an angry co commission or a witch on a broom, I'm not sure which, but in any case, um, I also uh, was very interested in the comments that Commissioner Peters made, and since I cannot talk to her individually about my curiosity, I have to bring it up here. Sorry, Commissioner. But um, I, I just would like to know more about what you mean when you say, uh, a really healthy benefit to our citizens because as an example of where I where my thought process immediately went to when I left the Florida legislature in 2010 the state budget was 72 billion dollars the state budget that they just finished up with today I believe it was 102 billion so you know, I, as well as a lot of us do, that uh, there are an awful lot of things in a big budget like we're dealing with here that we do not have control over, like the cost of rising premiums, for example, or some of those issues which we just talked about today as it relates to BTS and the advances in technology. So, you know, that that healthy benefit to our citizens that I that translates to me that they do have a healthy benefit by living in Pinellas County. We have a very solid county government and county administration that has provided enormous public services to our citizens. Um, that make this the paradise that we all so much enjoy, and none of that comes without cost. And I agree with you totally that that cost is getting really prohibitive, especially as it relates to affordable housing for our young people and our old people as well. I mean, it's, uh, 
getting to be a very dire situation because there's just no inventory. You know, if you're suddenly looking for a home and need to buy one, it's, um, it's just overwhelming. So I'm curious is all I'm trying to say. Yes, please, Mr. Peters. So yes, uh, not only are cost of living going up, but many businesses have really suffered and some businesses, because they can't get staff, have had to close down days. We have some right. restaurants that opened up and can only be open for three days because they can't get help. So, so they're having a hard time making ends meet just to pay the rent, um, the utilities, and everything that goes with it. And my, my thought, Commissioner, is we, we raised taxes last year to a tune of projected $31 million. And when Mike Twitty was here, he said that that um, is going to be significantly, maybe not significantly in your eyes, but up to 8% higher would be what we would collect. So I don't know what 8% is added on to $31 million, but where I'm coming from is that $31 million last year went strictly into reserves. It didn't go to pay for one bill. It was strictly designated to go into reserves and not pay for a bill. And I understand last year that there was a lot of unknowns, and we really did not know what was gonna happen. So if we put 31 million plus into reserves and didn't pay one bill, then I think this year, when, when, when our citizens went through the worst year, financially, emotionally, I mean, you name it, they went through an incredibly difficult year. Um, and we raised their taxes. And so uh, my thought is, if we, if we just went to the rollback rate, that means we would still collect $31 million plus and have no more bills to pay except for that 3% or whatever else make you, make you do. So I think if our reserves, when we see them all, if they are so healthy that I'm getting the impression they are, should we be working on more reserves for one year? I'm just saying maybe we should take one year off our reserves and let our citizens have a little break after the horrific year that they've had and how difficult it is for young people to find a place to rent where they can afford it. My son has to have a roommate because he certainly can't afford to rent an apartment in this county. And so what I'm, where I am coming from is I think since every single dime of our money last year, the increase that our citizens paid, went into a savings account. So we clearly felt that we should have their money and not them during a very difficult time that this year we should not be putting money, their money in a savings account for us. And that's all I'm saying is let's just pay the bills, whatever the bills are. If it includes the buses and the infrastructure, whatever the bills are, but can we take one year off on reserves, if in fact, when we get the reserve numbers in, they are as healthy as I think, I think one year off isn't gonna hurt us. And if they have a break for one year for these restaurants to catch up and hopefully people to get back to work and they can open seven days a week or five days a week or six days a week, where some restaurants can't be open more than three days a week right now. And I, I, that's, that's where I'm coming from. You wanna know where I'm coming from. That's, I'm not saying that infrastructure isn't important. And I understand the core function of this government. And I am not, saying at all that we should cut back on our core responsibilities of the core function of government. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is since we collect more than $30 million last year for reserves only, and, 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 and we put it in the bank because we felt it was better for us to have it in our bank than them to have it in their bank, that this year we reverse that and we don't put money in our bank just for savings and let them have a chance to catch up. So that's where I'm coming from. I heard you. Thank I you. Heard you say that. So I have a follow-up clarification question, Mr. Okay. Chair. I wanna, I'm just looking around the room because I want to make sure others get the chance to weigh in if they want yeah. to. No, my follow-up on what she just said, if you Go don't ahead. mind. So based on what you just said, Barry, did we not do that because mm -hmm. it was the first time, at least ever since I've been on the commission, that we were trying to put our eye on taking care of this year, but also looking out for 2022. Am I getting that correct? That's correct, which is the budget we're, we're gonna which be Which is the budget we're, we're currently for, working which on is now. To, to the commissioner's point, you know, yes. we're gonna be looking at reserves, we're gonna be looking at the, the level of needs. Um, and so, so for instance, okay, you take the 33 million that she's referring to, and I don't know if that's the correct number, but I'm assuming it is. 
Um, so you take the 33 million, now you have to put in the sheriff did increase expenses. So we, we, needed a, we need to look at that, right? Now, then we added body cameras that had a $4 million impact in, of one-time cost, but then a $4 million ongoing. So we can add those up though. We can have a crosswalk to show you where we're at. We're gonna be looking at mental health uh, services. And so, but that's my intent for this year's budget is to show you where you're at. Here's the money that we collected and here's, here's the changes since then to where then we can have a discussion about level of service and what we wanna provide in the final budget and whether or not it, that impacts what that rate should be. That's my intent. And what we're also gonna show you, thanks to, wait, is Jim still here? He's still here. Um, you know, is I, I show you a multi-year um, look at the budget to where you can see the, oper the ongoing operating cost of all the decisions that you make and the impact that it has on our long-term number to Commissioner Seal Point to make sure it's sustainable over time. Um, he created a, a, a neat tool that I think will be very helpful for you to be able to visualize kind of where we're at. So I appreciate your being more clear on that subject matter, Commissioner Peters, because as a final example, I heard you mention the word rollback rate. And as, a, as an example of why I have never thought that is really good public policy is because that's exactly what happened at Forward Pinellas a, a year ago, Commissioner uh, Eggers, or was it two years ago? No, it was probably si five or six years ago when we lowered the millage rate. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but now we're in a position where th that's problematic because we okay. haven't kept up and we have to do something to fill that gap. So that's something to keep in mind as well when you do that. I'm not saying we won't, but I'm just saying it's something to keep yeah. in mind. Okay, I'm done. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I and I you know I think that that's coming. We're gonna have that further conversations in June, and then the yep. actual budget that you're recommending will come to us in July. And uh, and you know again, I would say that you know we incremental creep of, of budgets is kind of natural. It happens, but when we have an opportunity on an incremental reduction. I mean, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what that that amount's going to end up being. I understand. It, it, it is important, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's 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 substantive, and sometimes it's symbolism. Um, and I, you know, again, I just think we have to. We're, we're all kind of going to go be going through that kind of thought process in yep. the next couple of months. Um, we don't want to put ourselves at risk going forward, but we do have some issues at hand, and I think Commissioner Peter spoke to that. Um, what our businesses and residents have gone through, and just kind of a supportive hand or supportive, uh, empathetic messaging is sometimes as important as the, the amount of dollars that you can mm -hmm. actually give back. Because it never amounts, everybody says, well, it's not that much that you're adding on. Well, it's not that much that you're cutting sometimes, but it does send signals. And I think we have to be sensitive and aware of that this year. So, yeah, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, and if we're gonna have that conversation, I think we should have the full conversation yep. as we're talking about that and what that means as far as, you know, if there is a reduction or if we stay pat or if we have an increase, all across the spectrum of what that is, total dollars for our budget, but also what it is for each individual property type, you know. Yep. You know, um, and that's a decision, it'll be a policy decision we can make. Is it worth cutting X million from the, you know, or not, not cutting, but not being able to meet the sheriff's request or not being able to meet the expanded mental health services that we wanna do or not in order to give you know, a two dollar and thirty eight cent. So, how much that needs to be part of that discussion as well. Yep, absolutely. Mr. Chair. Yes, actually, Mr. Gerard. we get to that point in the conversation, which we're not there yet. Um, could we take a look at if if budgets are increasing, which parts of our budget are increasing? Is it <laughs> BCC departments? Is it the sheriff? Is it, you know, where is that coming from? Because sure. We we can have, some I, of it we have no control over. I, I could tell you that right now, but I will have that ready for that discussion. <laughs> I can tell you that right now too, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, we and we we will do that. And you know, I I am very very sensitive to our to our tax rate, okay, and what we're asking out of our taxpayers. You know, uh, my goal for the BCC departments is for them to be able to, on a continuous basis, find efficiencies to even increase or to absorb the, the cost of, of labor, you know? Um, find efficiencies every year. 
the, the format that we set up today, or the last three days, first, thank you for giving us the time to kind of go through this. We're only halfway there. <laughs> That's what we've been doing since January, if there's any question. But you, you can see that you've got, you've got the analysts, and some of them it's their first time ever presenting to a board like this. So, you know, kudos to them for, for doing a really, really, really good job. You know, um, this is a learning experience. That's how we grow talent. Um, but it's also how they get ownership of having a fresh set of eyes on the way the department does something. So they can, they can partner with them. They can challenge the status quo. Maybe they have a new idea. Maybe it doesn't work, but maybe it triggers the department to think about something a little bit different that they can do. Um, so there's a real benefit in creating a team that, has, that creates a continuous improvement process, which is what we're, we're trying to do. Having a format like this, as you can see, is much more interactive. You know, and, and that's the reason we like this format. And I have no problems with putting it on TV and things like that. But just the format really makes it an interactive process. And we all learn, we hear different ideas, we hear your thoughts. Um, and so I think, it, you know, we, we have some refinement to do. We'll always have refinement to do. Um, but, uh, but I think the process uh, works to help us be better as an organization. So again, thanks, thanks for the time uh, these last days. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to take what you, we've heard from here and refine our budget process as we roll out and get to that J July date um, when we make a budget recommendation. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to, to that point, I was at a, apologize for being late, I was at a, a timely meeting this morning that I had to be at, but uh, there was a commissioner from another county at that meeting and I was describing what was going on these three days and and uh, for better or worse, he was very jealous and, and he's, planning on taking that back to their commission for how they <laughs> Good luck with that. do their oh, budget great. presentations. Now I'm going to have another person <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> yeah. So um, any, anything else before we, before we close out? Um, yeah, I think, I think the, the approach this, it was really good. And I think you made a comment yesterday. I had a lot of good discussions. Um, and I think that's great for us. It's great for our staff. Um, we really appreciate our, our analysts and the way they challenge our staff sometimes internally. Um, I was really impressed with Linda and her, and her knowledge level of BTS. I was like, wow, <laughs> you got to, you got to know the language to, yeah. to be able to be constructively, whatever, you know, critical or, or, you know, yeah. so I think that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so anyway, thank, thank your group. Uh, for all of their efforts. It was really good, really good stuff. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Hey, Bill, before you leave, just remember to tell them to keep telling us what page they're on. That is really helpful. That was helpful. Thank you. <laughs>